Well, welcome to our uh, second Atlassian Governance event. I'm Michael McNeil. I'm uh, from Expium and uh, our sister company, Oasis Digital. You'll hear, you'll hear more about that as we go along. The, this is kind of our agenda for the day. Um, we'll be covering these topics. We've got a number of speakers coming through and then an open discussion at the end. Um, we're going to be diving pretty deep into some of these ideas and uh, dealing with some things at scale. And uh, so I think this will be kind of relevant, and uh, I think we should have some pretty healthy discussions about this. Joe, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about this from Atlassian's perspective. Thanks, Michael. So uh, Joe Tong with Atlassian. Um, I've been with Atlassian for about four years now. Uh, my role at the organization is I'm a channel manager, and so I work with partners like XPM, connect them with customers, usually end up um, answering a lot of questions around um, not what products do, but usually kind of higher, higher order issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into, you know, what is JIRA and what is Confluence and how do they work. Obviously, you all are well past that. Um, because what I see actually is that with the maturity of customers coming into Atlassian, um, they start ru running into roadblocks. And, and it usually starts with, you know, who owns this and 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 then how do we manage this better as an organization? So the, the topics that you're running into um, right now. And so we do a lot of um, introspection on our products and on where our customers are finding value and how they engage. And we have a strong mapping to that whole customer journey process. And that's actually what this is on the screen in front of you. And so as teams start using products to kind of fulfill the needs of the business um, and start growing, that's where kind of that adoption takes place and users get added and another product gets added and apps get put in there. And once again, those questions are asked is, how do we manage this better and how do we control the data that's in there and who has access at what point in time? And that's where additional services usually start making sense and additional conversations start making sense. From an internal Atlassian standpoint, we do have some um, services that um, that are paid kind of engagements that extend into your um, Atlassian environment. So things like Premier and Priority Support, which you know serve as a higher level of escalation on product-related issues, and then a technical account manager, which is more of a strategic advisement as you're looking to roll products out over that. But that's really very much product-focused. Um, uh, um, support around what are you doing with the products around your business and that's really where partners come in kind of coming over the top and talking about just other services that are um, um, that are either you know at just kind of lending a hand in terms of administration or you know merging instances together and consolidation or those things like governance of how do you deal with the issue of just managing that environment and in the requirements around the business and so um, really, Atlassian was built as a kind of taking a step back as, as a um, not a, just a product, but as an ecosystem to be able to respond to teamwork and collaboration. And the thing I like most about it is I usually end up sitting at the crossroads of customers that are asking questions and trying to deal with those higher order business things as well as technology related items and the partners that can kind of come in there and provide um, the guidance and the expertise based on other customer experiences to be able to get you to a better place. And um, and that's what I'm most excited about this. And so I participated in the first governance event in St. Louis. Um, I guess that was last year. I'm really excited that they've taken this to the next level and are, are doing this again. Um, and so I'm excited to be part of the discussion today. And so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But um, happy just to be part of the uh, event. And Michael, back over to you. I wanted to give you a little bit about XPM because we're a little bit of a different animal in the partner space that Lassian tells us that all the time. Um, we're a highly technical firm and we don't have salespeople. So we're kind of unusual in that, in that uh, mode. So often we get involved in very complex, large uh, environments um, and solve some of those problems. And you'll hear a little bit more about that when I start talking about the uh, enterprise development teams that we build and work with. So um, we provide training uh, consulting, you know, the custom development side, and and of course licensing, and uh, but it's a it, so we are a full Atlassian Platinum Solutions partner, I guess you would call us, um, but we are unique. Um, I want to mention real quick on the training side because we build our own curriculum. Uh, we actually are have always been strong believers. Jira Bootcamp's been around for I don't know six or seven years now. 
Uh, we've had thousands of people go through it, and it's 100% uh, our curriculum, very hands-on. All of these other uh, classes that we do, and we're adding more all the time, are very much about uh, how, do you, how are you both strategic and how do you set things up and tactical and how you execute in a way that's replicable and scalable. And when we approach it that way, it just has a different feel. We're not just walking through the application. Some, and we don't want to be in competition with the Atlassian online classes. We're very much about a kind of a different mode and a, and a different uh, level. In fact, we were joking last night that we've got a couple of large companies that have probably sent 30 or 40 admins that they've had roll through their, <laughs> their environment over the last number of years. Um, so there's some interesting things that we do here. Um, one of the most popular ones we've had recently has been uh, the portfolio management uh, class where we're actually using portfolio at scale and helping organizations do that uh, for road mapping, product management, feature management, all those types of sorts of things. So we also do the consulting. Um, we uh, very much roll into organizations large and mid-sized and in, in the matter of uh, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, we will crank through uh, quite a bit of customization and uh, actually roll through uh, a full rollout um, where we might come into you know, thousands of users and end up you know, six, six weeks later, we're doing training and rolling out portfolio for the management of those teams. So um, the other side that I really wanna hit on, this will help with context here. Um, Oasis Digital is a sister company to XBM and it is an enterprise software development company. We have a lot of customers out here in the area um, we've actually done UI uh, development training for everybody here in the room on this side of the shop um, and probably many of the companies online. So uh, we actually build enterprise software. We typically work with uh, Google and the Angular for our front end UI, although we do React and Vue and others, and then uh, do a lot with Node and Java and C Sharp and, and all the rest of uh, the, the full stack enterprise development community. So what this does is it gives us an interesting perspective. Um, when a customer comes to us with a need, we make it happen. If we need a new permission level in portfolio, we actually build it and uh, deliver it in a few days. So there are some things that we can do at the uh, application level uh, without breaking the upgrade path for anybody that has worked with Atlassian for a long time. You don't ever wanna do that. Um, but we can provide some real enhanced functionality that is really important to the enterprise as it as the Atlassian products grow. Um, so I don't know if anybody has actually seen the Atlassian stock price lately. It's it seems to be on its own trajectory. Um, it's kind of following SpaceX on its way up to the skies somewhere we don't know where. But when I look at it, I think my goodness, this is interesting because there's a parallel here between what I see when I'm teaching classes and when I'm working with uh, companies. Um, I sit down with people, uh, with companies, or I sit there and talk to people in a class, and um, I say, okay, so how's it going? The problems are, you know, look, I've got to figure out how to do something here in Atlassian, but really, I've got to figure out how to get my company in order, because um, I've just inherited uh, something from, from uh, somebody left, and I'm now the new admin, and, and what I inherited is just an absolute mess. Or we've been around for so many years and our database is such a mess. Um, and about four years ago, somebody said, we should clean this up. And so somebody said, yeah, one of these days we'll get on that. And then four years later, it, it's now like four times as big of a mess. And, and really what it is, is it's a reflection. The two are running in parallel, right? As Atlassian continues to do a successful job, of course, their stock price will continue to grow. But what that represents in our companies is it rep represents this idea of you're coming in with one avenue in one area, and then as that works out very well, other people start to see it and they start jumping on it and jumping on it and jumping on it. So what I tell people in my classes and when I teach uh, people and consult with people is, what you're seeing in that Atlassian price is a reflection of what you're seeing in your company. And it's going to happen. If you are new to Atlassian, if you're moving from another tool into Atlassian, you need to get ahead of this wave because it's going to hit. Um, at first, it may not seem like anybody knows about Atlassian in your company. Uh, it may seem like you're the only champion of Atlassian in your company, but it doesn't take very long for people to start recognizing what it can do, and it grows quick. 
Um, I have people that I will start off an instance with them with a certain number of licenses. Within a few months, they're asking me to update the license and double it. Because as soon as people see it, they're like, oh, I want to be in there. That, that looks really cool. I want to check that out. How can I do it? Because Atlassian has structured itself in such a way that it empowers the users. It does have a lot of good form and a lot of good structure to it. But when you actually get to the point where things are being accomplished and things are being done, it's the users that are doing it. It's the users that are building their own visualization tool. Anybody that's ever built a large piece of software knows the complexity of actually trying to get information out of that software, right? And you have to go and find Bob because Bob's the only guy that knows how to technically write this report that takes him about three weeks to do because everybody's going to Bob, right? When you deal with Atlassian, it's like, no, everybody can build their own filters. Everybody can build their own dashboards. Everybody can build their own documents and spaces, and everybody can build their own macros in those documents. And suddenly, it starts empowering users. So when we think about Atlassian governance, we want to follow that example that Atlassian's already set for us. We want to implement a governance process that is actually going to empower the users. We want the users to motivate the governance process. Of course, you need to have some control. Of course, you need to have the internal champions. You need to have the people that can write the check, no doubt. But you don't want everything coming from the top down because that's not what got you successful in Atlassian to begin with. What got you successful was users getting excited about it. And so we want to try to have that same approach when we come to governance is how do we get the users involved? How do we get them excited? How do we get them being the internal champions of the governance structures that we're trying to set up. So as it grows, we're not out there actually trying to herd the thousands and thousands of new sheep that just continue to keep coming into the instance every day. They're actually standing up and saying, no, this is a good idea. Why don't we try this? Have you looked at this? They're actually talking to each other and coming up with ideas amongst each other and then coming to us as groups instead of individuals. And this is incredibly important because as you all know, if you buy an Atlassian product and then you want to buy an add-on or something like that, you have to have the number of users in the add-on as you do in the product. So if only a few people want that add-on, that becomes a really difficult situation. But if users are motivated, if users are engaged, then suddenly they're coming to you in groups of people and now, oh yeah, this makes sense because 20% of our users actually want this add-on. Hopefully what we can do today is we can talk a little bit about how do we make this transition to chaos, from chaos into structure. Um, when I teach in my classes, I always tell people what you're trying to do when you build a JIRA project is you're trying to take the chaos of the database and turn it into some sort of structural order that makes sense to your users. And so perhaps here in governance today, we can do the same thing. Maybe we can take the chaos that has become the, the excitement and uh, the growth that you're experiencing in your company and other people are experiencing in their companies around Atlassian tools and actually get that to a place where we can harness it and use it for uh, a little control, a little bit of user acceptance, a little bit of user excitement, and um, even maybe user ownership. So. So when I think about governance, I've always tried to think, what, what exactly is Atlassian governance? If I were to boil it down to one slide, what would that slide look like and what would I try to convey? And so um, those of us that were here last year might chuckle a little bit because um, we've kind of uh, had this concept of this idea of Atlassian governance being a facilitator of the power of your company. And what does that mean? How, how do we get there, right? Um, so last year we put together a pretty crude diagram that showed a rocket taking off in a control tower because we wanted this idea and it looked kind of silly, but then we actually found somebody that could really draw and we actually tried to put it together again because the idea was great. We just, we just didn't have anybody in the company that could do a, do a good diagram. So here's the idea that, that I view kind of governance as it's really two facets. Okay. There is the control tower like you have in a rocket ship you know, Houston, we have a problem, right? Or, uh, or, or a control tower in an airport or something like that. And, and that is super critical. And there's a lot of things that are very strict there and they're very tied down and they're very controlling, right? But the purpose of the control tower is never the control tower, ever. The second the purpose becomes the control tower, you completely lose focus of what you're doing. The purpose is the rocket. The purpose is the plane. The purpose is the trajectory. That is your company. That's your company making money. And one of the reasons why Atlassian is so powerful, one of the reasons why Atlassian does so well in companies is it understands this idea of we are not here to be the tail that wags the dog. 
we are here to support and push and implement the actual power that we're trying to do as a company. If a user is in Jira, if a user is in Bitbucket, we don't want them wasting all their time in Jira and in Bitbucket because the more they spend time in our software, the less they're making money for their company, the less the rocket's going. We want them to get in, get quickly. We even want to automate as much as we possibly can so we can get the rocket going. So it's this, it's this duality of incredibly important things where you can't live without either one. If you have just a rocket with no control tower, right, that's when you just you see a lot of what's going on, right? You got everybody coming into the instance and everybody wants to be an admin and all these things are going every which direction. It's like a rocket without a control tower. If you have a control tower and that's all it is, then it's like, well, you're going to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. But that doesn't work for my project. That doesn't work for me. And eventually people start saying, I I'm not really sure I understand how to use this product or why this product is helping me. I'm spending all day clicking through statuses or I'm spending all day trying to jump through hoops or I'm spending all day trying to find my admin so that he can do something for me. And so it can't be the control tower either. But at the end of the day, if you had to pick between one of those two things, it's got to be the rocket because that's where your company makes business. So the control tower needs to be a framework that is promoting certain activities that allows the rocket to accomplish what it needs to do. And what does the rocket need to do? Well, there's a couple of ideas up here, aligning strategies across the organization. This is a very powerful thing, especially in organizations that are siloed or that have grown up in different areas or two different groups that are merging together because one company bought another company or something like that. You need to align those strategies. You need to improve your processes. Um, a lot of times as things grow organically, and a lot of our businesses do grow organically, the processes are a mess and you need to have somebody in there that can actually improve those processes. Providing efficiency so that we're actually, like I mentioned before, you're actually working, you're making money for your company, you're doing good stuff, but at the same time, you're, uh, you're not wasting a lot of time, you're, you're providing efficiencies. So these are some of the, some of the uh, trajectories, some of the rockets that we think, but I'm sure there's many others that you can think of as you think about your organization. Uh, so how do we get these going and how do we get them going in, 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 in formation, like, like this beautiful picture here showing, right? So I was sitting there in the hotel room the other day thinking, well, gee, wouldn't it be nice if I came up with a nice little acronym for rocket? And so I just started writing down words that I could think of that had these letters in it. And then I'd go to the, uh, Google and I, there's like a website, you can throw a bunch of letters in and it'll tell you what words you can make out of those letters. And I really wasn't getting anywhere, but then it just hit me, um, and I came up with these, and I, I actually think they, they represent really well the goals that you want to try to move toward when you're thinking about governance. Um, representation. Obviously, you have to have representation in any governing body or in any governing uh, solution. And who that representation is is going to be very important to determining whether or not, that, uh, whether or not that's successful, right? Openness. Um, one of the things I love about Atlassian tools is they actually, I talk to people in classes and I talk to people when I'm consulting and they actually have difficulty sometimes with Atlassian tools because the tools themselves are forcing their company to be more open than they've ever been before. And so they're not used to that. And it's like, no, it's okay. When you build a filter in Jira, it's okay. You can share that filter because Jira is smart enough to know who can see it and who can't see it and that kind of thing. And suddenly it's like, oh, well, try this. Okay, well, let's talk about that. And suddenly you start having this open conversation going on. And so that has to, again, carry into governance. And it's really important to have that open dialogue so that there's a lot of activity. And we're going to talk a lot today about openness because if we're going to be successful, if we're going to mirror in governance what Atlassian has successfully done with their software, we have to allow people that aren't connected to be able to easily be connected. And we want to structure our governance framework so that it can be done that way. Brian's going to be talking a lot about that later this afternoon. Coordination, right? Now that we have an openness, how do we actually keep that openness from being too chaotic? It actually has some sort of structure or coordination around it. How do we have this person and this person and this person, even though they're from different divisions, maybe even completely different groups within a company, right? One's software, one's HR, one's PMO. How do we get them working together from a Atlassian governance standpoint? Knowledge. Again, a great, great opportunity in Atlassian tools is the knowledge, especially with Confluence. Confluence becomes a parking place for public knowledge bases. And so people can, as they learn, they're no longer trying to figure out, well, where do I replicate this? 
Um, one of the biggest complaints I get from people when I talk to them is I've just come in and uh, admin left and he left about a month before I came in and I have no idea what he did. And every time I hear that, I'm like, well, wouldn't it have been so much better if that previous admin had just captured some of the stuff in Confluence and just left it behind as breadcrumbs for the next people? And so these artifacts, these uh, documents, these things that we want to do, we want to leave that behind for people so that as a whole, our company can always be much smarter than any of the individual parts. And of course, expertise. We need the people that know what they're doing. Um, we need to find those people. We need to share those people around the organization. Um, this is George. He's a great person in this particular area here, but nobody else knows about him because George is being sequestered in a corner. There's no open knowledge. There's no open co openness. There's no coordination. There's, there's no representation. And so this idea of how do we get that person out into the open so that we can utilize his expertise? Because what we want to see is we want to see George times two and George times three and George times four. So expertise and expanding expertise. And then, of course, teamwork. Um, teamwork is the idea of, in my opinion, all of this together with people motivated by a vision. In order to have successful teamwork, you need to have two things. You have to have someone who can cast a good vision, and then you have to have the rest of the people that are excited about it. When people are excited about a, a vision, problems are worked together as groups to be overcome. They're not things that people sit around and complain about because the vision sets the uh, forward goal and people all move toward that. And to me, that's what teamwork is. To me, teamwork is when we're sitting here on the launching pad, trying to build our framework to promote our future success, somebody is out there telling us what that rocket is going to do and how incredible it's going to be done. Even if we don't even exactly know yet how it's going to get there, somebody's casting that vision for us. And that's what, that's what really supports teamwork. So this concept, this overall concept, there's a lot of things there. I suppose as if I continue to do my word search, I could have come up with some other great words. But those were the words that I came up with that I thought really kind of met the need. And then, of course, they, they fit the acronym as well, too. But um, just another quick anecdote. I know in our company, we have this situation where we have this crazy guy that comes up with these ideas. And you know, that's me. And I'm like, OK, we need to do this, right? And so I literally have a whiteboard the size of the screen behind my desk and I just randomly jump up with markers and start scribbling on it. And then I send out emails to people saying, let's do this. And then Michael's like, what are you doing? But we also have another person on our team who's really good at processes. And he says, yeah, yeah, let's do it. But let's not do it that way. Let's, <laughs> let, me, let me work on that for a little bit. And then he comes back later with a process. And we're like, OK, yeah, we actually have a process that, that will accomplish that vision and things like that. And, and that all happens. I mean, we have the fortune of being in a smaller company. Obviously, we're not a Microsoft or we're not a Google where we have thousands and thousands of employees. But so we have the opportunity to actually have these conversations. But having that open environment, having that opportunity to be able to bring people's skills to bear, everybody has a separate skill that they can bring. And understanding what people have to bring to the table, understanding what their personalities are, what gets them excited and things like that. These are all things that are um, really important in building that teamwork out, building that vision out, uh, and actually being able to complete things to move forward. And we're actually, um, I know Brian's going to talk a little bit even this afternoon about how you do that, how you work with people in their individual um, skills and, and how to draw those skills out of people. Um, Unfortunately, I think a lot of people come to a scenario with, with concern. If, if, if I bring my skills to bear, what's going to happen? Um, are people going to listen to me? Um, if, or, or even on the other side, people are going to listen to me, and then I'm going to find out later on that they took my ideas, and they ran with them, and they, they claimed them themselves. These are all kind of the ugly henchmen of the corporate business world that we all know is out there, but we want to fight against that because all of that is going to be – is going to eventually take away from the, from the rocket. All of that's going to take away from the trajectory, from where we want to go and the goals that we want to accomplish. And all of it actually at the end of the day is, is going to take away from governance too. So when we think about governance, I like to break up governance into two areas. Uh, this is going to be the impact of governance across your enterprise. But as I've worked with people in governance and I've talked to people about governance, I find that it kind of tends to coordinate itself off into two areas that are sometimes very interchangeable, but it's really important to identify the, those two areas. One is in the area of what I call product governance, and then the other is in the area of enterprise governance. 
So as you have Atlassian come in, oftentimes people come uh, bring Atlassian to their organization through maybe one or two products, but eventually they grow, right? Even the person that's bringing in Jira software could very easily in a few months be bringing in Jira service desk. And then all of a sudden, oh, we need portfolio on top of that. Oh, we need, you know, Confluence now. Oh, now we need, we need you know, our, our teams using GitHub and things like that. So we want to start migrating to a Bitbucket environment so that we can work on these collaborative tools. All it takes is one event for somebody to see the aha moment of a collaboration between two Atlassian tools, and they will look for that all the time. And so we have this idea of governance for products. How do we actually manage these products across the company safely and successfully? But then there's also just the general idea of governance in the company as well. Um, what exactly exists in our company as far as governance? Who are the people that are motivating governance? What are some of the things that we've captured already for information around governance that we can actually use as we continue to grow? So those two areas I want to kind of talk about um, and break them out. I'm going to first of all start about start start talking about um, governance for tools themselves. So. This may be a little bit specific. Uh, some of the tools you may have in your organization, some of them you may not have. Um, but these are some ideas, um, really just from things that I've learned uh, uh, over the years talking to different people. So of course, uh, we've got JIRA. Um, and the interesting thing about JIRA is that when I first work, when start working with somebody with JIRA, um, the concept of a project never even comes up. They, it's just, it was, yeah, it's a project, right? But then, like, all of a sudden, like, many months later or even years later, people start thinking, well, what, what is a project at JIRA? I mean, at, at its crudest level, it's a, it's a field that you fill in, right? So it's something that you can search on in a filter or run a report on. But what exactly is a project? And so part of the governance around JIRA a lot of times needs to be the discussion and sometimes early on of how are we going to frame up our projects in JIRA? What's a project going to mean to us? Is it going to mean the same thing for our team as it does for this team? Do we want to establish some ideas around our company as to what a project should be as a platform and then maybe grow from there? Um, it becomes, and a lot of times, one of the most simple and yet most complex conversations that you can have in an organization. Do your projects align with your products? Do your projects align with your team? Is there a one-to-one -one relationship between your team and your projects um, or your team and your products? Is it possible to successfully have one project with multiple teams. Can you, if, especially if you're working in an agile environment, can you have three or four teams that are actually meeting and working with issues that are spread across three or four different projects? How does that map out in the form of visualization tools? Um, and then there's this concept of, can we move eventually over time, maybe not in the beginning, but can we move eventually over time to the point where our projects in JIRA become more evergreen? They're actually things that are standard, stable. Everybody understands what they are. Everybody knows what it is in there. And they, are, they, 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 they remain part of that rocket trajectory. And then teams and issues and other activities are just managed as part of that evergreen process. Um, this is actually a really super important question that has to be discussed at some point if you want to be uh, serious about governance for JIRA. And maybe in the beginning, you're not ready to discuss that. And that's okay. Um, a lot of times in the very beginning, people are just trying to figure out, I don't even know what the difference is between an issue type screen scheme and a field configuration scheme. How am I supposed to tell you what a governance project is, right? And that's fine. But at some point, and hopefully sooner rather than later, there can be that conversation of what, what does the project actually mean for us? And of course, keeping in mind on this, as well as many other things, what a project means for us may be something different than it means for someone else. And what it means for someone else may be something different than it means for these other five teams that right now don't even know what JIRA is. But as JIRA continues to land and expand in our organization, they will soon hear about it and will want to use it for their activities as well. So that's one concept. Of what's a project, right? The second one about governance in JIRA is, is this, this phrase, but I inherited this mess, right? I, I, it wasn't me. I, I, I just came in here because the other admin built this mess and then he, and then he, and then he took off, right? Um, what does that mean for people? How can we support admins as they come in and they're seeing this overwhelming situation? Um, one of the ways we can obviously support them is help them out with just making sure they understand good processes. Um, getting them to a place where they can safely learn about best practices in JIRA and things like that. But really, what kind of standards, what kind of rules do you want to establish as an organization 
that basically says, if we bring in a new Jira admin, this is how we're going to support them. If a Jira admin abandons ship and somebody else comes in, how are we going to get them to the point where they don't leave in two to three months? Because that's like the worst case scenario is every person comes in, they kill themselves for a few months and they're like, it's just not worth it. So what are the governing processes that we can set up in Jira that actually support these admins as they come in? Um, here's the other side of that. There's some people I talk to that don't want to be an admin. I got inherited in this mess and I don't really want to be an admin. Then there's other people that are, I, I hear talking to my admins that say, I've got these guys that are keep emailing me. They want to be an admin, right? Um, make me, can you make me an admin, please? I'm trying to figure out how to do this in my project and it's just not working out. Well, you know what? Maybe that particular person is a good person to bring into our governance environment because it seems like they're motivated around Atlassian structures and Atlassian tools. But what is the process? What is the rules and the structure that we want to set up to make sure that every person that asks for admin rights because they want to change this configuration and that scheme and this workflow and all that kind of thing is not just going to get rights right away. So within six months of starting Jira, you have 100 users and 30 of them are admins. Um, what, and, and there's actually some specific things that we can lay down and talk about that actually say, how do we make sure that happens? What is the avenue? If somebody wants to be an admin, what is the avenue to getting them to be an admin? And also, how can we work with that person to get them to the point, do you really want to be an admin? Do you know what an admin has to go through? Or do you just need this problem solved? And if so, how can we get that problem solved for you? Stop the database dumping. So, um, there is... There is not a person that I have talked to that has been in Jira for any number of uh, months or years that hasn't told me my database is a mess. And it's this idea of, there, well, there's a lot of things. There's some specific things, right? Like if you go and create a project in Jira and you do it with a template, it goes and creates about 10 to 12 different database elements right off the bat. And if that particular project is going to match that template exactly, fine. But Quite often it doesn't, which means you're now switching out different database elements with other database elements, and those database elements just park there, and they're not being used. Um, even if you create a project and then you're like, oh, whoops, I forgot, I don't need this project, I'm going to delete it. The project goes away, but the database elements stay in there. Jira Service Desk is a very powerful tool, but we found with Jira Service Desk, they take that problem and, they, and it, it multiplies it. If you create a Jira Service Desk project, you will get 15 to 20 database elements that come out of that Jira Service Desk project. Now, it's great if you need those, but what can you do to start working with your policies so that people are not just creating project upon project upon project, and every time they're doing, they're dumping 15 to 20 database elements. So within a matter of months, you have hundreds of database elements. Nobody can find anything in the database, and your performance is bogging way down. And there are things that you can do to specifically lay that out to say, no, that's not the avenue to go. Come over here. Look at this project that already exists. When you spin up an instance, one of the first things I do when I work with a company and spin up the instance, before we even invite anybody into the instance, the admin and I will sit down for a day and we'll say, what kind of projects do you want in here? Let's set up a few templates with that. Because you have to, because when you're out of the box, you got to use the templates because there's no existing projects already. What are those templates we can build? Now let's build four or five of those out there. Let those be the templates that everybody else can copy. So in the future, everybody's not recreating all these database elements. They're just piggybacking off of the templates that we've already built. Things like that. Very tangible things that you can do to not only save your database, but also save your admins from pulling their hair out, especially if they got put back into the situation after somebody has left. And then abandon ship. Like, did, did Steve just really say that? Abandon ship? So I've worked with companies. Um, I've, I've worked with companies that are Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 250 companies. I worked with about a year ago a company that was a Fortune 250 company that had 41 instances of Jira on their, in their co uh, corporation. 41. And I said, you know, do you need all those? And they said, no, what's happened is that because Jira is such a great tool, this group over here st spun one up and this group over here spun one up and this group, and now we've got these 41 instances and we have no idea how to get them all together. And I said, okay, well, you know, we work with people like that. You know, we've done a lot of work with ETL and we can pull stuff out of this instance and put it in this instance and map it together and help you upgrade your instances so they're where they need to be so they can merge and stuff like that. But that takes a really long time. What about this idea? Why don't you just do one instance that is structured with the right governance, with the right organization, with the right structure, and start using that instance with your next project? From people's perspective, 
oftentimes it's just going from one URL to another URL. They don't really need to have in, uh, cross information between these two projects. And so you have this new instance that's actually built out correctly and well, while the other instance is just kind of over time, just no longer being used, projects retire and things like that. And so now you have 42 instances, but eventually over time, 40, the first 41 instances can be reduced down to 30 or maybe 25 or 20. And then you can knock down the activity. People don't need them. Yeah, sure. Maybe you need to keep it for auditing purposes. Fine. Give it 10 users, you know, so it's a lower user count. And then you can just park it there. Things like that. Um, maybe sometimes that's the best option. Now, that's a pretty scary thing, like to be the solution. We're just going to abandon ship. But... If you have a good governing supporting body that actually lays that out as a possibility, suddenly instead of people saying, well, I got this like, crazy idea, why don't we just do something right and go from there and start over again, they're actually going to bring that idea to light because the governing body and the governing processes are going to say, you know, in some cases that might be the best solution to do. So, Thoughts or questions on our JIRA before I move on? All right. Of course, Confluence. Um, the one thing that's very interesting to me about Confluence is as locked down as in tight and as rigid and as detailed as Jira is. Confluence is almost the opposite, right? So in Jira, you have projects. In Confluence, you have spaces. You can't build a project in Jira unless you're an admin. But if you're uh, a user in Confluence, you can build a space, right, if you've got the permission set up for it. So you have to have this idea with Confluence almost different than admin, uh, with Jira. When I work with people with Jira, I'm dealing usually with one or two persons, and it's very easy to say, okay, these are the, these are the templates we're going to set up. These are the standards we're going to set up in Jira. When I get to Confluence, we have to have this long, we have to have a conversation before we even engage people in Confluence. What is a space in Confluence? How broad do we want these spaces to be? Don't forget, Confluence is going to be our knowledge-based source. It's going to be the knowledge, our best tool in that rocket. Uh, on knowledge as far as getting people together and having the shared knowledge and actually promoting knowledge. So we want to make sure that the spaces are structured that way early on. Of course, you have your personal spaces, but what do you want people to do with their personal spaces? Do you want them to actually use those or do you actually want people to be doing those kinds of draft documents or draft activities in another space? Um, divisions. Does it make sense when you, before you actually introduce people into Confluence to actually set up a separate space for every major division in your corporation so that anybody that's new in your corporation can just go to that space and instantly see a bunch of good information that will help them be educated like that on what that division's doing? You have a, you, we we want to promote a lot of cross skills and cross activities. Well, if one person is moving to another team to do some work there, wouldn't it be great if before we actually sit down with them and, and waste about an hour in a meeting explaining to them what our team does, we actually have all that detailed out for them with all of our team's goals and all of our division's goals in a space, and they could actually go. Have like a different space for different teams and things like that. Um, projects. Again, going back to this idea of projects versus teams, that's going to have an effect on how you're going to want to structure your spaces to begin with. We're talking about governance, of course. So why not have a governance space? One location in Confluence where everybody can go and see everything that they need to see about governance. So different things about that. Knowledge dumping versus collaborative content. So we got a lot of knowledge out there, especially if we have a large organization with a lot of users. So how do we put some controls in place? Again, this is the control tower helping the rocket to achieve the best it can so that we don't have hundreds of little dumping grounds of information, but instead we have collaborative content. People know if they have an idea or if they have a document or a blog or a how-to article, they know where to go to put that so that it fits into the rest of the machine and can support everybody else. Um, standardization, right? Confluence is all about do uh, documents, templates, blueprints. Which of our documents are going to be templates? Which of them are going to be blueprints? Where are those going to live? How are we going to standardize those? Who builds our templates? Are there templates over here from this team that can be used better for that team over there? All of this is, is really important to have uh, open stuff. And then personal, personal content and spaces. You know, do you want to use that or not? What's the impact going to be on personal spaces within your, uh, to your database? Do you want to just open up personal spaces to people that ask for it? I mean, if you have 2,000 users and only 10 people want a personal space, that probably is not going to have a big impact on your database, but it will actually motivate people to get involved in Confluence and learn about Confluence, and maybe they become your Confluence champions down the road. Instead of just saying, no, we're not going to do personal spaces because that's going to kill our database. Well, maybe just give some people the ability to do a personal space. Okay. 
Portfolio. So Portfolio comes on the scene a few years ago and everybody wants it, but nobody understands that Portfolio takes about as much time to configure as Jira does, right? And the reason why is because it's not just a, it's not just a chart, right? It's not just a report. It is a tool and it's an intense tool that does a lot of things. It, it actually requires its own set of, of, of organization and things like that, making sure that people know what portfolio can do. So for example, one of the biggest things in portfolios is tiers. In Jira, we know that there's not really a lot of hierarchical tools in Jira. Jira wants to be very open-ended and allow people to build things the way they want to. So there's not a lot of hierarchical tools, but when you get into portfolio, there are. So what does this mean? This means that people that have been using Jira for the last five years and suddenly want to use portfolio now have to go back into Jira first and figure out what the heck they're doing in Jira so that it works in portfolio, right? And so as a result, we have a lot of tiers, right? Instead of the tiers that we want to build out. Um, and how do you do that, right? Because don't forget, if you're looking in the realm of portfolio, you're probably looking outside your division as well. As soon as you structure portfolio well, it's going to be your leaders in your company that are going to want to be able to see things. They're going to be, want to be able to map your forward capacity, uh, map your, uh, uh, your, your dependencies and things like that. So if you're building out tiers, wouldn't it be great if you could actually have collaborative tiers across different divisions in your organization? So I've got a software division. I've got a PMO division. I've got an HR division. All of them are going to be interested in using portfolio. So, okay, we sit down with them and say, look, guys, you're going to have four tiers in portfolio. You guys sit down and figure out what that looks like. Bring it back to us. Let's collaborate on that. If you're in software, you know, maybe you've got the traditional tiers of I got an initiative or maybe a feature or epic or a story or a task. But maybe if you're in PMO, you're looking at something like maybe a division. And then under the division is a position. Um, or, or a project, I'm sorry. And then under a project, you maybe you have a milestone and then under that you have a task. Um, maybe, in H, maybe in HR, you're looking at the same thing too. You've got a division and then maybe a position and then maybe a candidate or something like that. But these all can be aligned from a governance standpoint if we lay out the framework. Okay, we've got 10 divisions in our company. Most of them never even heard of Atlassian. Two of them are going gangbusters. Let's lay out the framework so that when the other eight hear about it and want to get involved, they already know the steps that they need to start thinking about internally so that when they bring their ideas and their thoughts and their desire to join the party, it's already lined up for us and we can just plug and chug and keep going. Fast iteration, rolling one division in after another. Um, and then... Uh, I like this one. I wonder what this button does. So when, when I first pulled up por portfolio for the first time a couple of years ago and started playing around with it, I noticed this little button up at the top uh, that said something like submit these changes back. And I was like, yeah, I wonder what this button does. And it, it actually is this situation that once you bl build a plan in portfolio, you can actually adjust the estimates and do a lot of different things in there, which that button will actually take all that information and write it right back into JIRA. Um, so as portfolio grows in popularity in your organization, I mean, you're paying for it for every user. So if you got a thousand users, you're paying, if it's cloud, you're paying $3 and 50 cents for every user to have that more people may want to use portfolio. So how many people do you want to be able to push this button or that button or things like that? Um, this is something that needs to be determined from a governance standpoint. We need to sit down and we need to say, what are these buttons that exist in portfolio? Who can do what and how do we want people to do that? So we don't get, we don't ever want any one of our users in there saying, I wonder what this button does, right? Um, and then, of course, teaming up for success. Portfolio gives us a great opportunity to bring in teams. Teams, how do those teams in portfolio map to your teams in your organization? That's a great conversation to have with, with, uh, with governance in mind as well. Um, and then you've got all the source control tools. So one of the great phrases that I borrowed from Atlassian and I probably use in almost every time I work with a client is Atlassian is about autonomy versus visibility. I don't even know if it's still out there on the website somewhere, but I saw it at a website and Atlassian one time and I thought, what a fantastic idea. Autonomy versus visibility. Is that not like the ultimate goal of actually maximizing the value of a company? Here we've got a wide array of people that are just digging in, working all day long, trying to get their job done. And what, what should happen to them? But along comes a director who just uh, happens to need to make a report to some shareholders or something like that and just crushes them by asking them, where's this report? I need to know this information. And they're like, what? Okay, fine. I'm going to go burn 
burn another, a day and a half putting this report together for this director. And then by the time I get back to my job, I don't even remember what I was doing. And the rocket is just kind of dove for about a day and a half, right? Um, so along comes this tool, this fantastic tool, Lassie, and it says, no, 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 no. If you're there working, if you're the person that's actually in the trenches, digging the trenches and building things and making this rocket go, keep doing it. Just keep doing it. We're going to give you a tool where it's going to give you very little uh, effort to come in and do this. Most of it's going to be automated for you. We're ready to rock and roll. You just do that. And then the director over here, we're going to set up a report from him and it's going to feed automatically, right? So whenever we think about Atlassian tools or we think about source control tools, we always want to keep this idea in mind as we're working through governance. What is the autonomy versus the visibility? How much do we want to free up our people that are really doing the work and making this rocket go so that they don't have to waste time trying to do visibility? Like how often is a developer really a, a rock star on building out visibility tools? Maybe, maybe not, but we don't want him to do that. We want him to be a developer. And so what we want to do is we want to sit down from a governance standpoint and say, when we're dealing with these source control tools, let's isolate people as much as we can so they can do their job and then let the tools work for themselves and bring out the reports that we need to. Let Bitbucket manage JIRA through triggers and things like that. So, And keep it simple. Um, simple is always better. Simple is better with workflows. Simple is better with source control. Simple is always your best friend. Um, and I said, keep it simple, my friend, because I just didn't want to call anybody stupid. So I said, keep it simple, my friend, right? And then what are your standards? How are you collaborating these source control tools with different teams? How are you sharing knowledge around the source control tools, best practices, and, and things like that? Okay. So that's what I kind of call governance for products. So each product has its own set of benefits and challenges, and you really need to dig in uh, when you're thinking about governance and figure out how do we maximize the value of these tools, not just for one team, but for all teams, not just for teams now, but for teams in the future as well. And in addition to this, um, we also have to think about the broader governance because everything we just talked about is not going to happen unless you have a, uh, a culture of governance that's already been established, something that's been structured. And so what are some of those things that have to happen? Now, when we think about governance, our mind can go in a lot of different directions. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to corner in key ideas about what we call enterprise governance so that we can actually look at those partially so we don't forget something. When I work with a client on governance, a lot of times I talk to them and as I'm going, I'm getting excited about this, that, and the other. And quite often I wind up forgetting something because um, – uh, there's just so much stuff to talk about. But if you can kind of just highlight it on maybe five or four or, or six different main categories, it gives you a really good uh, way of making sure that you don't leave anything behind so that as you get down the road and you're successful, you realize, oh, we should have done this. Um, so one of the first things that, that really matters, of course, is your policies. Um, so, for example, what are your basic uh, rules and standards around people versus tool relationships? Uh, I'll give you a classic example. Um, how well are you using in JIRA groups versus roles? And how is that tying into your broader corporate requirements around managing people? Um, things like this. In confluence, how are, how are we setting up people in confluence? These are really important discussions that have to happen, not just at the product level, but across the board because we're growing across teams. So what are the, what are the relationships that we want to establish uh, for future success around people and tools? Um, how about training requirements? Um, we're bringing in hundreds and hundreds of people. One of the best things about training is it not only helps people use the tool, it gets people excited about the tool. So in our JIRA boot camp class, which I did earlier this week, it without fail, there's going to be a period of time in the class. It's different for everybody, but there's going to be a period of time in the class where I see the students say, oh my gosh, now I know how to do this, or now that makes sense. So I've just given them a tool to go back and help them in the company, but I've also just made them a, a loyal JIRA fan for the next few months until they run into the next major problem that they're frustrated with, right? But it excites people about it. And so if you're going to have a growing environment, if we know that Atlassian is growing as a company, and it's growing as a company because in our companies we're seeing growing users, 
Can we then set up some governance protocols that say, hey, yeah, we are going to need some more admins eventually. So let's get ahead of the curve. When we move from 500 users to 1,000 users, maybe we need to bring in another Jira admin. So if we know we're going to do that, let's make sure that we have a process in place that says, as we grow here, we're going to need these admins. And then a few months before that, we're going to send that admin to a boot camp or something like that and get them prepared. So what are the standards that you want to set up around training and getting people so that they can successfully use the tool? Um, What's the process for an individual, one person, right, in the microcosm of the rocket to promote or, or, or eventually purchase something in Atlassian that they need? Uh, nothing uh, will get somebody more excited than when they find something that's useful for them or what they're trying to accomplish, and they're like, this is what I've been looking for. I'd love to use this. And then nothing will kill that enthusiasm more than saying, well, buddy, I'm sorry, we've got a governance process and it's only on the 5th of May that they're, you know, that the governance emperor has, you know, deigns to walk among the people and ask them what add-ons they would like to purchase, right? No, what if that person goes to Confluence and he's like, I've got this awesome idea for an add-on. I'm going to go to the Confluence page and space that I already know about and I'm going to pull down the policies that I already know exist on how to purchase an add-on and I'm going to follow those processes. Now you're taking his empowerment and you're allowing it to move into the company and allow that rocket to continue to, to travel. In addition to that, everybody else that's involved in the process knows exactly what he's doing. Bob over here has got a great idea for an add-on. Oh, he's just going through the normal process that we all go through whenever we want to build an add-on and things like that. Um, what defines the enterprise's governance processes or the change management? Everything that we're talking about today. What are those? Are those documented? Are those identified? Have they been discussed? Um, are they, are they um, dynamic? There's no reason, especially, and we'll talk about this a little bit today, when you build out a governance process using Atlassian tools, it gives you the power to have dynamic governance processes. And so what are some of these processes and have they been identified? Have they been communicated out to everybody? What's your policy for governing policies? Um, what policies support healthy, healthy governing bodies? What are your requirements going to be, your policies around governing bodies? Your governing bodies are going to be your framework. We'll talk about this in a second. That actually manage your governing policies. But the people that managing the governing policies, just like you, you, know, you, want, all, you want all subjects to be, uh, to be under the law. You don't want anybody to be above the law. So the same thing, even if you build governing bodies, you still need those governing bodies to understand that there's policies for governing bodies. So those are governing policies. That's, that's one kind of big area that you want to really focus on, figure out where you're going. And this is going to be very dynamic. It's going to grow and change as you grow and change as an organization. Because when you first start off, you can't possibly think of all the policies that you're going to eventually need. So just best practices. I mean, this is, this is fantastic tool. So I call this a governance thing, although really it's just, it's, it's what's going to cause your rocket to really go well, have high fuel efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. What are the best practices? How do you draw those best practices out of people? How do you have those hard conversations around best practices? What's the best way to build and structure a sufficient, strong, but limited Atlassian admin team? This is the, probably the number one best practice that we work with people. Um, and, and I see it on both sides. I see people that there's one admin for a thousand users because all of the users and all of the uh, leaders in the organization don't understand what it takes, how different it is to admin or to manage a Jira or a Confluence uh, instance when you have a thousand users versus it was when you had five or 10. Um, and, and the other thing too is I see people there, they're managing large instances, but they're also acting as project managers. At a certain point, that you, you got to cut the umbilical cord, right? That, that those are two different groups, right? And then I see the other side of the equation where we've got a lot, of, a lot of users, but then like a very high percentage of admins. And so everybody's out there in the database and nobody really knows what's going on. So what's the best mix there for that? It's different for every company, depending on what your company does, how big your company is, and things like that. That's a best practice. Define that. Write it down. Put it somewhere. Best practice to structure your Lassian environment. Um, this is, we're going to get into this later this afternoon when you're talking about building the structure that your environment lives on. So it's, it's kind of funny. One of the things that really motivated this entire governance structure and governance discussion that we had is as I talked to people, I used to have this old 
janky slide that was like a house and, and in the house were different rooms and the different rooms were the different uh, uh, products that Atlassian had and, and now it's kind of out of date because it still has HipChat and, 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 and Stride in there. And then underneath it was like the foundation and the foundation was the where, like where does your Atlassian live? Is it data center? Is it cloud? Is it AWS? Is it Microsoft Azure? You know, where does it live, right? And then over on the right side, I'd have the who. Who are the people in your in your world that manage the Atlassian universe, and and who are and, you know what roles do they play and stuff like that. And and this was just a diagram that I put together based on the conversations I'd have with people. But as soon as I'd show it and start talking through it, people would like jump on me, and they say, "Can you give this to my boss?" You know, I go, why? Well, because I used to be this, and now I'm all of these, and I need to just be this here and stuff like that. And so. One of the conversations that would come out of that all the time is the where side, the foundation side. Where does your Atlassian live? Um, whether you're in the cloud or whether you're in data center or wherever you are, um, it's important to understand this, to, how to safeguard your environment, how to protect your environment. Or, you know, are we going to have a, a test in a prod environment? Are we going to have a QA environment? Now, one of the really good things about best practices here is I'm talking about where your platform lives, and I'm also talking about how do you create a successful environment for admins and things like that, right? So one of the things that you can do to save your admins, especially as your user count grows, is give the other people that really have a lot of responsibilities in Atlassian tools their own instance to play around with, right? So if you've got a project manager that every day is hounding an admin about build this project for me, build that project for me, have a QA or a test environment where those guys can go and play around so that at the end of the day, it's up to the project manager and their teams to build out the projects, to test the projects, then bring them to the admin and say, this tests really well in our group, okay? And we've also, because we have the policies in place, we've also are pretty much in compliance with your, with your structures that you've laid out for us from a governing standpoint. Now all the admin needs to do is take the 20 or 30 minutes it takes to load that into the production environment. Okay, best ways to promote good governance across your enterprise. These are, these are kind of um, intangibles, right? These are kind of subjective things. We want to build a governance structure. We want it to be a good governance structure. But what's the best way to actually promote that? Once you learn, once an event happens, once you've got a nice anecdote, that actually can be documented and captured so that people down the road can remember. These are little like milestones that we build for people in the future to know we were really successful in implementing this because we did this thing or this event happened or we tried this and it worked really well. Those are all can become best practices in how to continue to promote your, your governing and your healthy governance. Uh, and best ways to promote Atlassian training, education, exploration, future best practices. All of those things should be documented as best practices. It should not be a mystery to users if they want to go to training, how they go about doing that. If they want to buy an add-on, how they go about doing that. All of that should be documented as, as best practices for them. So best practices. So we have Atlassian policies as a general idea, and then we have Atlassian best practices as a, a general idea. And then, of course, the governing bodies. There is no governance without the governing bodies. But when we say that, a lot of times, some of us cringe internally because we're like, I, I, this just hampers things. This is the tower uh, dragging the rocket down, right? And so how do we really work to, uh, to, to avoid that from happening? What is your governance structure? What's important for you in a governance structure? Who's in each governing body and why? That's a really important question because that's going to help you leapfrog this whole idea of top-down governance or dictatorial governance and get you to a point where your governance in your governing structure is grassroots-based and user-based. What's the purpose and activity for each governing body? Identify that. Include it in that. Identify how those governing bodies can be efficient, right? We need you. You're a great user. You're a great expert in this particular area. We need you in this particular governing body. I don't have time for that. That's fine. It doesn't take any time, right? It's it literally, we don't have any meetings scheduled. It's all right here. You just need to check it out. And then occasionally we need to read something, review something and talk about something. But, you know, how do you structure those purposes and activities for those governing bodies so you can set the framework early on so that those governing bodies are not onerous to people that are involved in them? How do you promote user engagement within the governing bodies? How do you get the people that should be in the governing bodies in the governing bodies? How do you actually get people to um, want to be in the governing bodies? 
So one of the things that I do outside the world of XBM and Atlassian is I am uh, the committee chairman for our local Cub Scouts. And the number one responsibility for a committee chairman of, uh, of a local Cub Scouts is to find volunteers and drag them in. And, and so what I try to do is I try to figure out unique ways to get people involved into our, our community. Um, and, and we were losing our Cub Master, which if you know anything about Scouts, is a very important role. And so I was viciously looking around for a new Cub Master before our old one left. And where should I happen to find one but at the Pinewood Derby, which is this major annual event that happens with the Scouts. And his, his, my son's car and his son's car both made it to districts. So we're there at districts. And of course, we're talking to him. I didn't even know him, but we're talking to each other because we're from, from the same pack. And as I get to talk to this guy, I realize this guy's involved. He's excited about Scouts. Scouts. His kids love Scouts. He's at this, he's at this district event. I wonder if he would be a good person to start grooming as, as, a, as a Cub Master for me going forward. And so I started talking to him about it. And it's the same idea of finding people where they're interested. If somebody is interested in add-ons and they're always interested in add-ons, then maybe they're the best person to actually help build and manage your governing policies around purchasing add-ons and things like that. Please. What's that? I do. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm almost done. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, do I have any examples of governing bodies? And, and exactly, I've got a couple more slides here. Then we're going to take a break. And then the next section is actually going to be a layout of, of um, a case study on governing bodies with, with examples and things like that. So yeah, great question. Um, okay. So what's the expectation, of course, of each governing body? What's their meeting cycle? What, you know, what does each body do? Who talks to what bodies, depending on what things they need to get done? So governing bodies. So we have policies, best practices, and governing bodies. I think we've got two more here. The governing framework. So this is something we're going to talk a lot about later this afternoon. But the question is, wouldn't it be great if, like, Atlassian, we're, 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 just, we're going gangbusters in Atlassian. We've got tons of users. It's growing. Everybody loves it. Wouldn't it be great if Atlassian had a tool where we could document governing structures and policies? Hmm, let me think about that for a second. Oh, yeah, maybe they do. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we actually had a tool where we could track all of the governing policies and events? Like, you know, like a tool where, like, when something needs to be done, it goes through a workflow and it actually has activity. Wait a minute, we might have that too. Wouldn't it be great if all of these tools were actually visible across all teams, right? So that it could not only be managed from the top down, but it could actually be managed and viewed and acted on by users. Oh, well, maybe. Maybe we have that too, right? So, Governing framework, actually, this is what I like the most about doing governance with Atlassian. Most of the principles we talk about today could be applied to any type of software product that you have in your organization. But the thing I really like about doing it with Atlassian is it not only helps you understand the governing policies and principles and best practices, it gives you the framework that you need to do with all of this. So we're actually going to take a section, an entire section this afternoon, and talk to you guys about how you can actually use the governing uh, the, the, the Atlassian tools themselves to build the frame out for the governing process that you need to build out. So I won't go into a whole lot more. That, that'll just kind of be my, my tease for later this afternoon. So uh, governing bodies, governing framework, uh, governing policies and governing best practices, and then finally, how-to articles. Um, so how do you make on onboarding more efficient? So I'm working with companies now where we have uh, anywhere between 500 to several thousand users. They want to implement Jira across their platform. We want to do it in a, in a controlled way, as we've been discussing, one that's going to help people stay motivated, but still keep the rocket on track. And so what are some of the ways that we can make onboarding more efficient? What are some of the how-to articles that we can provide to people? So we're going to implement a project. We're going to train users. And then those users are going to jump into some sort of agile scrum project in Jira. Well, how do they get from the training where they learned how to use the software as a user into getting their project running? Well, how about a how-to article that they can go to and say, now that you've gotten training, how do I start my project? And they can just go there and they, this is who you talk to and this is the information you need to provide them and things like that. Um, of course, promoting knowledge sharing across the enterprise. Anybody that learns anything should be trying to put, our, um, trying to put artifacts together so that it can be shared and replicated. Promote and reward expertise and research. This is something I think um, a lot of companies don't do nearly as well as they should. 
there is a cost to rewarding uh, expertise and research and training. But I think, even though it may not be hard to draw the linear line, I think there is definitely a greater value than there is a cost to it. Um, most people that I see leaving on the last day of our training are taking with them tangible things that they've built into the uh, training instance. They're taking away with them exciting ideas that they've never seen before. They've had conversations with five or 10 other people in the class and have networked with them around solutions that they're having. I will have, usually by the second or third day of my class, I will have students talking to each other, helping each other and consulting each other on things because everybody is excited about this. Those are actually gems of opportunities. Yeah, it costs some money to do it, but put together some policies and put together some how-to articles. What if I'm frustrated because I want to do this, this, and this, and this, and I just can't quite get there? Maybe I want to do some training, but maybe as an individual user, I'm one of a thousand and I don't really know how to get that done. But maybe I can go to a document that tells me that's been written by my governing bodies. If you want training, this is how you do it. If you want expertise, this is how you do it. If you came up with a great idea, guess what? Once a month or once every two months, we're going to have a session for an afternoon where we're going to bring in, make it at five o'clock, we're going to bring in some beers or whatever, and people are just going to share great ideas that they came up with across the organization over the last month or two. These kinds of activities are incredibly valuable, but it only works if when people have the idea, they can trigger on it then. If you send them a notice that say, hey, guess what, next month we're going to do this, People may not have those ideas when they read that notice, and so they may just kind of file the email and not forget, and not even think about it. But if they have an idea, and as soon as they have an idea, they're like, I'd love to share this, and they know where they can go to find the how-to article to talk about when the next event is going to be and things like that, then they can start planning for it and thinking about it. Build a, big, uh, a habit of good knowledge, documentation, organization, searchability. Um, what, are the, you know, what are the how-to articles to train people on how to search for things that they need to search for? Uh, captions less, uh, lessons learned the first time and promote that knowledge across the teams. Uh, create an opportunity for people to want to capture and document artifacts. I don't know what that could be, you know. Uh, Confluence has this really fun thing called questions for Confluence that whenever somebody is frustrated, they can dump a question out into your Confluence space. Other people can jump in and answer it and everything. And then the person who asked it and other people can vote it up or down. And you get these points. And it's really kind of funny. We do this in our Confluence boot camp. I'm like, okay, everybody go out and ask a question. All right, now everybody go out and answer the question. Now everybody go vote on it. And then we like click and you can see the experts. Well, this Bob was the expert for this class because he got the most votes or, and things like that. It, it's kind of silly, but in a way, it takes it to the level where it's a little bit more fun. And people start to get motivated about um, uh, building out different documents and tools that they need to do so that you now have this knowledge base of how-to articles that's growing and growing and growing and also manageable and searchable in your organization. Okay, so how-to articles as well. So when we think about all of these different things together, there's a lot here, right? Now, so I've been up here talking for a while, so I'm going to let you guys take a break and, and kind of uh, clear out your heads a little bit. But I'm not really here to solve your individual problems right now. I'm here to get you thinking. I'm here to throw some ideas out there. And I, I can tell you 99.9% .9 of the things that I'm talking to you today have come from other people. So I am implementing in my own life of working with Expium and Atlassian the governing principles I'm talking about of calling this information and then displaying it back out to other people. And I do this all the time. Hopefully some of the things, ideas that I've thrown out this morning have gotten you thinking about things that you could do better or maybe you are doing already and you're like, yeah, that's great. That's a good attaboy. We actually got that. We're actually doing that right now. Um, and maybe start to build a framework around that. So not only do you have the value and the data and the information and the content out there, but you actually have it structured because you don't want people just having to feel like they got to look in a dictionary for a word, but they actually know where different things are depending on what they're dealing with, what successes they've had, what frustration they've had, what things they need and things like that. In order to, again, uh, promote and, and escalate that rocket with uh, representation, openness, coordination, knowledge, expertise, and, and teamwork. Okay, so one of the things we actually talked about um, in the previous section was governing bodies. Um, when we think about governance within our communities, we want to look at, think things from the perspective of the uh, governance for the products as well as governance for the enterprise. And then one of the elements in the governance for the enterprise is governing bodies. So what, what are some of the things that we can do to build a, a structure around governing bodies? 
So the example I'm going to give here in this, um, in the next half an hour or so is really going to be, um, just one way you could do this. We've, we've implemented this with folks and it's successful, but you know, this is just an idea. Obviously we don't want to be too struck too structurally rigid with our, with our format here, but let's just assume we've got a, um, an Atlassian platform of about a Jira admins. Um, one of them is an Atlassian admin, so they manage Confluence as well, and the other Atlassian tools like Bitbucket and that sort of thing. So let's also assume that there's a lot of robust activity happening in this Atlassian ecosystem within the company. Uh, people are growing, people are developing things. You've got people that are really engaged in Atlassian, so they're actually building uh, customized tools and things like that. People are looking for add-ons and things like that. Um, and then let's maybe suggest that we even have a scenario where we're bringing another another company in this, this, this company is purchasing another company and that company has got, um, quite a few people that are using Atlassian as well. Maybe not as many. Uh, so we have a scenario where we're actually trying to figure out how to get two Atlassian platforms merged together. What kind of structure for governing bodies could have been established ahead of this that would have allowed this scenario to be somewhat successful? So typically we're going to need at least four groups of people in, in our governing body structure. Um, and those are defined as the Atlassian Steering Committee, the Atlassian Products Ad Administrative Group, the Atlassian Systems Administrative Group, and then a fourth group, which is not really part of the governing bodies, but actually exists from the perspective of just uh, good practices. And that's kind of this base tier of project managers or product managers or dev managers or however you would call it in your organization. Now, there's a reason why this blue section is down here at the bottom of the triangle, at the base of the triangle. Um, it's not technically part of the governing bodies, but the governing bodies are not going to be successful without it. These are the people that actually are going to be represented in the governing bodies. These are the, uh, this is the group that is going to feed the governing bodies. Uh, this is the group that is going to um, make the governing body successful. As we go through each of these, you'll see some of these governing bodies may have people involved in them that lie outside of this blue box at the bottom. Um, we may want to have some directors or vice presidents uh, moderately involved in this governing body just in case we need to get something done, right? But by and large, we're going to see a lot of movement and feeding from that lower box up into the upper, upper areas. So first of all, you have the Atlassian Steering Committee. The Atlassian Steering Committee is going to be the executive committee support for all activities that are going on. This is going to be a two-way street. They're not only going to be the group that is making decisions, they're also going to be the group that is making sure that this Atlassian product and this Atlassian governance structure is being supported and promoted throughout the organization. These are the people that are going to answer the question to some of the higher-ups in the organization of, what is this Atlassian thing? Why is it causing issues or why is it so successful and who are the people involved in it and why do we have this governing body and why should we listen to these people and things like that. Um, they're going to be also responsible for some of the initial activities. If you are fortunate enough to actually have some governance structure before you even implement Atlassian tools, um, these are going to be the people that are going to motivate the initial implementation of the Atlassian tools, deciding what tools to purchase, how many users should be in each tool, how broadly it's going to be uh, laid out for uh, starters. Um, the purpose of the uh, Atlassian Steering Committee is really going to be um, to provide the executive support that's needed um, so that the other Atlassian groups in the triangles can actually do and the base can actually do what they need to do. Um, so their purpose is going to provide executive support. Their scope is going to be enterprise decisions, and their structure is going to be uh, probably concise. Um, we want to keep the structure as small as is possible, um, and we'll probably include uh, a combination of senior personnel in the company and Atlassian experts. Uh, these are people that are going to be, we don't know how many they're going to need, maybe for a company of 1,000 users that are maybe bringing in another company with 250 users, we've got a steering committee of maybe four to five people. Okay, um, so who is the, uh, what is the reporting responsibilities for the Atlassian Steering Committee? 
Primarily, they're going to be reporting up to senior management. There may be uh, reports that are necessary along budgeting uh, things. If you have a thousand users, you're going to be licensing, license budgeting. If you're bringing in another instance, there's going to be maybe a need for consulting budgeting to help this actually happen. So these are the people that are going to champion those needs. Now, again, I can't emphasize this enough. The reporting that they're going to do up is going to be from the perspective of the Atlassian Steering Committee, but the information, the content, the motivation behind that reporting is not going to come exclusively out of the Atlassian Steering Committee. These are reports that they're going to be doing based on things that they have learned and heard and, and received and fed from some of the lower groups, and, and they're basically representing uh, those lower groups. Um, there's also going to be at least one liaison in the Atlassian Steering Committee that's going to feed down to the ASAG and the APAG. That liaison, depending on how it's structured, may actually be somebody like the JIRA admin. Um, if you have a primary JIRA admin, and in a, a case where you have about 1,000 users moving to about 1,200 or 1,500, you may have about three to four um, main JIRA admins or, or main uh, confluence admins. We'll just loosely call them Atlassian admins. Um, at least one of those people should probably be in the ASC itself. Um, and so that person is going to act as a member of the ASC as well as a member of at least the APAG and act as a liaison between the two groups. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person's going to be responsible for bringing all the information into the ASC, but he's definitely going to be responsible for facilitating the people that do need to feed information up into the ASC. So it's going to be, for as far as the actual uh, committee itself and their, their definition of what, it, what it, they're going to do, it's going to be the ASC's primary responsibility to make all final decisions for the enterprise implementation as well as purchasing decisions. Uh, this will be an easy job for the ASC. So again, as we talk about this structure, we want to build it and we want to implement it in a way where people that are involved in it actually have the freedom to do what they need to do in their normal life and not be bogged down in endless meetings, right? So we are going to have the ASC be the responsible party for making final decisions for enterprise activities and for purchasing. However, the information to help them make that decision and sometimes even the decision itself hopefully is going to be coming from some support groups into the ASC. In other words, if the APAG is producing to the ASC a decision for a purchase and they've actually coordinated with the ASAG already, then the ASC really doesn't need to do a whole lot. All they need to do is put their stamp of approval on it. And that's kind of the simplicity that we want to have happen at that top level. The more we can do that, the more our governance process and our governance policies and our governance structure is going to be dictated from the ground up, not from the top down. Um, specifics for the Atlassian Steering Committee, you're going to have support, key decision-making, purchasing, investigation, and timing. What kind of timing activities are going to be necessary for this particular activity and groups that we're going to do. Um, the ASC may need to meet, but what we really want to do is we want the meetings to be driven by need and not to be driven by schedule. In, in the case of all of these, we are going to really shift away from the traditional paradigm of policy groups meeting based on schedule and move it to me meetings based on need. We really want this to actually happen periodically, and we want to, again, use the Atlassian tools as much as we can so that we don't have to have people constantly needing to get together in a room to talk about things when those types of information can be facilitated with, with uh, tools or other, other things. And, and when, I mean, when I say tools, I don't mean just email. So uh, decisions. So the decisions are going to be facilitated as quickly as possible. And again, in order to do that, we're going to want to really push the activity that happens and comes up into the ASC through the governance of the lower body so that when it comes up there, it can be a quick decision. We all know this is a good idea. We voted on it. We're 80% confident or something like that. All we need you to do is, Mr. Bob, Vice President, go put your stamp of approval and go write a check for us. And Bob's going to say, well, you guys do a great job and everything you've done so far is successful and everything I expect you to ever do in the future will be successful. So surely I'll put my stamp of approval and go give you a check for a half a million dollars to go buy whatever it is you want to buy, right? So that's kind of the hope. Um, however, sometimes there may need to be a situation where the ASC does want to uh, create an investigation committee for some reason. Um, maybe there's a, a, a larger thing happening. For example, in the scenario we're giving where we're actually purchasing another company and we're bringing in 250 to 500 more users in Atlassian, it's possible the, the, uh, the ASC will want to maybe build a subcommittee 
and the subcommittee's primary responsibility will be to help support and motivate the other governing bodies and other governing activities to make sure that when that happens, it's an actually actually a success. Because um, as you'll see when we get into the lower lower governing bodies, there does need to be some coordination done between those bodies. If not, you're going to run into a situation that I have seen, which is pretty ugly, where from a product side, you're ready to go, but from a system side, you don't even have people because you didn't get on their schedule. All right. Um, so the ASGs should not be so large as to hinder efficient decision making. We do not want a lot of people in there because the more people we have in there, the more activity and decisions and, 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 and things are going to happen in the ASC. We don't want a lot of that to happen in the ASC. We want the ASC to primarily not be a work group but a facilitating group. So the key primary responsibility and the key point with the ASC is that it's going to be reactionary. Um, it's not going to be really casting a lot of vision. Uh, because if it does, then we have a we have a top-down dictatorial uh, vision being cast, and we don't want that. We really want them to be reactionary to the enterprise as a whole and to the needs that are presented to them by the APAG and the ASAC. Um, but the ASC may obviously need to make some governing changes and decisions, and it may uh, and they they're going to be the responsible party for making that final say on those decisions. So, um, so that's the Atlassian Steering Committee. Um, let me move down to the next level, which is going to be the, uh, the system group. So um, the system group is going to want to be separated from the product group because it's going to be really important for us to differentiate when we are doing governing and governing bodies. What is the difference between system activities and product activities? I'll give you a great example of that. System activities is going to be, okay, how do we connect users into Atlassian tools? What is the platform that we're using and how is that platform structured? For example, if you have an active directory, the system group and the people in the system group are probably going to be the ones that are responsible for managing the active directory. How does that active directory tie into Atlassian groups? How are groups and users set up in that active directory? Once it gets tied into Atlassian groups like JIRA, how are we using users and groups versus roles to actually implement that? Some of this is going to need to be coordinated with the product group, right? Especially if we want to use users and groups from a system active directory standpoint, but when we actually get down to projects, we want to use roles, then there's going to need to be some conversation that happens between these two, uh, between these two groups. Um, but the system administrative group is going to primarily focus on the, uh, that system thing. And it may be, um, how do we implement something? It may be, um, what kind of hardware do we need? It may be um, when we're in, in, in the scenario we're talking about, when we're bringing in another company that's got 500, 250 to 500 users, how are we going to blend those users in? That kind of thing. But what we're going to find with the system admin group, which is different than the product admin group, is that the system admin group is going to be bringing in people as they're needed because the system, um, the system expertise is going to be very broad. Right, so like the email admin is going to be different from the database admin, who's going to be different from the, um, from say the Active Directory admin, who may be different even than the Atlassian System admin, and you're going to have a wide variety of people here. You may have an AWS expert or some other cloud-hosted platform expert that only needs to be brought in as you're merging the instance together. Once they're brought in and he's got his work done, he can go on his merry way and work on the next AWS project for the corporation, and doesn't need to be bogged down by being a part of this all the time when his work is done. So, the primary purpose of the ASAG is going to be, uh, they're going to be responsible for maintaining the Atlassian system and the security uh, when, while establishing and maintaining access to the Atlassian product. So there's three things there that they really are going to focus on. One is going to be the system itself. The second one's going to be security. They're going to work with the compliance group and the security group within the corporation, especially if the where, as in where does your Atlassian live, touches on that compliance. Um, and then the third thing is that they're actually going to be maintaining the proper access into the tools. So this can have an effect when we ask the question in the governing policy and the governing structure, which of these groups is responsible for which Atlassian tools, that might change, right? Depending on the type of tool, it might be the ASAG versus the APAC. Back when Atlassian had HipChat and Stride and those other tools and Crowd and those, um, those might be the, or would have been, or now maybe with Slack, would be the responsibility of the system admin team, whereas tools like Jira or Confluence or Bitbucket or other add-ons like Portfolio or other marketplace add-ons may be the responsibility of the, the product admin team. A lot of it is focused on people, 
if you're connecting with people, then it's probably related to system admin. Um, if it's connected with products, then it's probably going to be on the product admin side. Um, the trick with the ASAG is going to be the level of expertise with the systems, which is going to mean that you're going to have to schedule. So when you're dealing with the ASAG personnel, these are people that quite often are not focused exclusively on Atlassian or the needs of this, even this governing body. So you've got a particular person that's necessary for doing something on the system. They're going to have six or seven other projects that are pulling on them. The, the really important thing with the ASAG is that somebody is working with this group and even internally, you may even want to have a representative member who is a high expert in Atlassian but also has some technical skills or system skills to actually act in that group as the ringleader, somebody whose responsibility it is to tie the people that we need at any particular point in time into the other activities that are happening in the rest of the governance and activities in Atlassian so that we can schedule them out so when it comes time to do something, they're there. Um, the last thing we want to have happen, especially with our integration with this second company, is for the product team to be real, you know, ready to go with their projects and everything, and then the other company comes in and we don't have the right system people to do it. So, um, When it comes to reporting, reporting obviously is, uh, the ASAG is going to report up to the uh, ASC. Um, they will report up to the ASC around specific things that of course relate to system activities. Uh, or people activities, or even integration of products. Um, there is going to be a spillover with integration of products between the APAG and the ASAG. The APAG may be the one that decides what products need to be brought in or what add-ins that need to be brought in. They may be even the ones that dress that up for the ASC for final approval, but once it's approved, there's going to be kind of a back-end workflow where the ASAG may be needed to actually implement it and tie it together. Um, so there's going to be uh, definitely some reporting and communication to the ASC. There's also going to be a need to have a lot of communication between the ASAG and the individual users as it relates specifically to system events that, that have to happen. Um, for liaisons, therefore, you're going to have liaisons up and liaisons down. Um, your liaison should probably be a consistent member of the ASAG, somebody that understands the user's needs as well as the system needs. However, the, the, by, by and large, I would say 70 to 80 percent of the members of the ASAG may not be consistent. They may come and go as is needed. Okay, um, so some of the specific things that the ASAG is going to focus on is admin rights, hardware management, security and logs, certain user tools, software implementation, system backup, and, and that sort of thing. Um, as far as meetings are concerned, the ASAG probably will not need to meet at all unless there's a major system activity that's going to be happening down the road. And um, again, because these are going to be people that are technical system people, they are not going to get, want to get bogged down in meetings. So it's probably best to have one or two people as members of the ASAG that are going to be good coordinators rather than trying to drag all of them into the room to have some sort of meeting. That might be necessary occasionally, um, especially with a large integration. But by and large, we don't want these guys getting bogged down in meetings. Otherwise, they're not going to show up. They just aren't going to show up. I've, I've been in situations where you're trying to do an implementation, and so you have a, a let's all get together and talk about this. And, you know, 50, 60 percent of them don't show up. And now the conversation's useless because you're missing the people. It's better to have somebody who has a, has a good broad picture from a project standpoint and from an Atlassian standpoint that can actually target these people individually and try to get them committed. Okay. Um, of course, the ASAG is going to be responsible for all the decisions that relate to system structure and user management. Um, and then uh, the representation for the ASAG. So what you're going to see is... so. Our scenario, we got 1,000 users with maybe 1,200 to 1,500 coming in with a new company. Our ASC may be four, five, or six people. The ASAG may have 10 or 15 people in it. But the point is, is that there's only going to be two or three of them that are consistently involved in the ASAG. The other 12, 10 to 12 people just come and go as needed. So you could be a member of an ASAG and may not even participate in the ASAG for 12 months or something like that because it's going to be specifically based on what's needed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the key point to remember with the ASAG is that they, they're going to need multiple people uh, to manage a variety of system issues, including hardware, security, and implementation. 
Um, and therefore, the challenge is going to be to make sure that you're coordinating well with each of these individual people so that you can get them when you need them and at the time you need them. So that's the, the ASAG. Um, product admin group. Uh, your product admin groups are going to be your experts in the product itself. These are the people that love to go to Summit. And these are the people that love to call up Joe and harass him and all kinds of other things. Um, but basically, the, the product admin group, their purpose is going to be the Atlassian products, specifically around the, the organization and the control around the Atlassian products. The APAG group is going to be your champions of governance. The ASC understands the value of governance, and they may be the ones that need to make the stamp on the final approval, but they are probably going to be looking to the APAG to actually build out the governance process, especially when we're dealing with things like tools, right? Um, How-to articles, best practices, policies. These are the people that are going to be needed to write that tool. The primary purpose of the APAG is going to be to be responsible for creating and maintaining all the shared product elements within the Atlassian functional tools, um, as well as coordinate with project managers down below to facilitate the efficient uh, product structure and make recommendations to the ASC for additional products and add-ons. They're going to be the kings and chiefs of config. Uh, they're going to be the ones that are going to understand exactly uh, what tools should be brought in when. You're going to want people in this group that when a admin is brought, or I'm sorry, when an add-on is brought in as a suggestion, they're the ones that are going to be keen to understand how that add-on's not only going to affect the need, but affect everything else in the group as well. Because they've got the experience, they've got the depth, they've got the understanding. They're going to be a consistent group of people, and also they're going to be a group of people that are not independent to the APAG it's very likely that these people are going to be users or maybe even project managers. They are going to, they're going to live, live most of their lives in this section down here. Okay. And they don't necessarily have to be a product or project manager. They could be just a user that happens to be really good at understanding Atlassian tools, a subject matter expert. Exactly. Um, these are people that you really want to, um, take care of and protect. If they want to go to a training class, you want to be able to, promote that training class. If they want to go to Summit, you want to be able to promote that and send them. They want to go to a governance forum, you send them to the governance forum. But basically, they're going to be the people that are going to form a core group of product knowledge. And they're basically going to be your, your, your head of around how this thing is actually going to work from a product standpoint. Uh, from a reporting standpoint, obviously, they're going to report to the ASC. The better this group is, the less the ASC is going to have problems or going to need to take time, right? This is the group that's really going to drive efficiency in the ASC because they can pre present to the ASC everything that the ASC needs to make, needs to have in order to make a quick decision. Um, and so that's going to be the, the primary reporting. Of course, they are going to re uh, um, also communicate down to the product managers and project managers. But if this works really well, they don't even need to because the people that are comprised in the product admin group are actually the people that live day to day in the teams. And so they're already communicating because they're the same person. So that's, that's when you really got it. Um, there is going to need to be upon occasion, some probably intense coordination and communication between the APAG and the ASAG. Um, so those are going to be the uh, key reporting and liaison responsibilities for the APAG. Um, specifically, some of the things that the APAG will be uh, responsible for is uh, uh, tools, uh, admin personnel, database management, functional database elements or configuration elements, uh, add-ons, product alignment, and conflicts and things like that, uh, making sure that we're not bringing in products that conflict with each other uh, and that sort of thing. It might be helpful for the APAG to meet on a regular basis, not based on a schedule or demand for a schedule, but only because in a group that large with 1,200 to 1,500 users, there's probably going to be something to talk about at least once a month. And so these people have their own jobs. They're going their own direction. It might be valuable for them to commit to each other and to sit down and have a conversation. Perhaps the best thing to do on that would be like a Thursday afternoon at the local bar, uh, you know, because as they say, uh, write drunk and edit sober. So maybe that'll be a good time for them to get together and, uh, and, and talk about the, the vision for their, their organization as they go forward and, and the different ideas that, that each of them has fielded throughout their organizations 
over the last over the last month or so. Right? Decision processes in the APAG will often be like voting or or research and and. I would think that if the APAG has, uh, has done their job and the people that are promoting information to the APAG have done their job, that oftentimes votes will be unanimous because all the information has already been uh, talked about and discussed and hashed out o over a beer or whatever, right? So the key point for the APAG is that they're going to need sufficient personnel for implementing and, and, and maintaining the elastin and functional products. Um, however, it is strongly recommended that this personnel be kept to a minimum as they will have likely have admin rights. Um, so if we're looking at our structure here, we've got the um, ASC that's got maybe four or five people in it. The ASAG could easily have 15 or 20 people in it, just giving our, our example of our, of our structure of our company and the growing company with the, with the, with the merger. And the APAG, maybe five, maybe five or six. Uh, maybe of those five or six, two or three of them are going to be your admins. Um, and or or um, maybe two of them are going to be admins, and then three or four or five of them are going to be some uh, some expert, some subject matter expert, some Atlassian expert, or or something like that. Um, so now we have our our rung down at the bottom, and this, these guys here, interestingly enough, they are going to be people that are the same people further up, right? Um, some of these people may be in the ASC. Some of them may be in the APAG. Uh, maybe not as many of them would be in the ASAG, unless for some reason your company actually uses Atlassian products to manage system responsibilities and system activities. In that case, you may even have system admin projects and things like that, and indeed, they could be part of it as well. But the prob primary um, responsibility of this group as a whole, apart from the people in this group that are represented in the other sections of the governing bodies, is going to be to actually provide user feedback to the governing body. We are going to want to garner that feedback from the top down, but we're also going to want the people to actually express opinions, information, knowledge base, and things like that uh, up as well. Um, so primary scope of the project managers here is going to be to communicate to the ASAG and the APAG as necessary, coordinate with each other to, uh, to support the requests that are happening, and also to help with the communication and education process. Um, so... The, one of the questions that we're going to have, and, and again, everything we do in governance, you guys saw that kind of atomic structure that we laid out before in the different bubbles on it. But everything in that bubble ties in some way to another bubble. And so when we get down to the bottom of this triangle here, this is where we tie the governing bodies into the rest of the governing process. This is where we tie governing pro the governance around products and the governance around uh, best practices and policies and how-to documents and frameworks into the governing body. It's going to be really important for us to figure out how that's going to happen. One of the ways we can do that is we've got teams, we've got projects, we've got activities going on. Finding those people that are the actual day-to-day -day users that are excited about the tool, that understand the tool, setting them up as key people or key liaisons in between the users and this group. We do not want the governing bodies to start drifting away from the users. That's going to be disastrous for our entire governing process. It may go well for a while um, because things that are heavily controlled can, but eventually it's just going to disintegrate. We want this to be primarily grassroots. So in order to do that, when we think about how to build this governance structure, what parties should be in this governance structure, what actual individual groups should be there, we actually want to have a conversation around the names. And not only that, but we want that to be open. Everything we do in the governing body is open. So, for example, once you determine who your ASAG is or who your APAG is, that's a list of names that go on a, uh, go on a list that actually can be viewed by every user that is using Atlassian products. So, if a user says, hey, I want this to happen or this isn't working or something like that, he can go look at that list and say, oh, these are the guys that are in the APAG. Let me go talk to one of them. Let me go take one of them out to lunch. You know, Let me get to know one of them or something like that. And then... All of this activity that is in this structure, who these groups are, who's in the group, what each group does, what we're expecting of the group, as well as what we're expecting of this lower level here, all of that becomes a, uh, a best practices document that's available for people to review as well and look at so that we continue to promote that grassroots activity. We want questions coming up from the bottom uh, in, in as little as possible having things dictated from the top down.
So that's just one example of a structure that you could build. I think the structure is one is going to be one of the most important things in your um, in your governing uh, governing setup because without a structure like the governing bodies here, uh, you don't have anybody in your control tower. And so it's it's in some ways it's a necessary evil, but if we can continue to promote it from the grassroots up, then the people in the control tower are perhaps the people that have lived in the rocket for many years. All right. So, hi everyone. Uh, we're going to start off the next part of this with me. My name is Brian Dar. Um, a little bit about me really quick. I, I worked in Germany and Japan. That's probably the most interesting thing about me right now. Um, and surprisingly enough, working as a public school teacher in Japan and working across different cultures in Germany uh, gave me a lot of skills that I did not expect to work nearly as well as they turned out to work in corporate America. So what I really enjoy doing, though, is making things, opt uh, optimizing things and making them more efficient, um, and especially focusing on people in that. So building systems that really interact with people, not forcing people to interact with the systems I build. And that's what I really enjoy doing. So the tools that we're building uh, really do build consensus and build teamwork around a process that people don't have to waste their time on. As we said, we, we really try to reduce the number of meetings that we have to do by using JIRA and Confluence uh, to do what they're designed to do, to reduce meetings and to increase team communication. So almost all of what I present, though, is going to be actually in the tool. So I'm going to get out of here, swipe over to this guy, and we're going to come right into our playground instance of Confluence. Everyone should have a playground. This is ours. And we're going to land in a space that we created called Atlassian Governance. So let me make sure that I'm on track here. So specifically, as all these tools relate to the APAG and ASAG and the ASC, uh, we want to get all of their knowledge into this system so that everybody can see it and interact with it. And hopefully, this will reduce the number of emails and phone calls and hallway conversations that you need to have to really keep this, uh, to keep this ship going. Of course, this also feeds into the bottom-up structure that we're doing. You have the committees uh, create documentation. You have the users add to that documentation. You still do need a captain steering the ship. Uh, so up at the ASC, you definitely need somebody saying, this is where we're going. Here's the tools to go with it. <clears throat> and these are the tools that you build to support that. So the purpose of Confluence is to give everybody information right when they need it. And this would be the landing page that we'd use. So it would explain why we're doing Atlassian governance. And again, this is very generic. You'll need, you'll need to customize this to your own company. Uh, it has uh, various diagrams that you would use to explain the governance setup. And then based in the space directory, if I expand over here, we have a governance structure, we have policies and standards, and then we have how-to articles. But of course, focusing on the user, we keep all of that down here. How-to articles already expanded, ready to go for your users to get the information they need instead of coming to you. Um, before I go into those, though, I, I want to talk about the blog feature of Confluence. This is possibly one of the best ways to announce changes that you're making to your Atlassian products. So instead of having to send out an official communication throughout the company, you could just write a blog post. This is one right here. We made some changes. We updated structure. We updated the Epic, Epic Feature Translator. And you could add anything else. And as long as people come and watch this space, and you can encourage watching and Confluence as a, as, a, as a company culture, they will get an email update every time uh, one of your space administrators sends out a blog post about updates to all of your Atlassian products. So no more extra emails, at least from, from a drafting standpoint. Over here, we have how-to articles. And we have chunked these down into various sections. So basically, base, based on Atlassian product, and if you like this structure so much, you could throw in how-to articles for the rest of the products that your teams are using as well. So Bitbucket user how-to articles, these are usually pretty, pretty few and far between because developers are particularly good at Googling and figuring things out for themselves. So you don't really need to build these out as much. However, when we hit to Confluence, we could include things like how to add dynamic content. And this is a really good example of labeling things appropriately for, th for the end user. So macro doesn't mean anything except maybe a virus-laden Word document from the 90s. So instead, if you say dynamic content, people might respond a little bit better to that, and you sort of nudge them into the macro language there. Uh, you might make a how to bring your JIRA data into Confluence page. So one of the best parts about Confluence and JIRA and the reason that we're paying per user to use Confluence is because they talk so well to each other. So encouraging your users via help documents that they bump into while they're here 
uh, go, oh, I can put my Jira data in Confluence. That sounds great. I've always been wanting to document my software project like that. How to collaborate in Confluence this is another one. So this is actually something that we teach in our classes. But and and I'm sure you've noticed that. And we were having a conversation about this at, at, at dinner last night. Maybe your maybe your Confluence users aren't particularly keen on using the tool because nobody's ever showed them how. But if you point them all in the direction of a general help repository, now they can go, oh, I can collaborate with this tool? Fantastic. I can watch. I can at comment. I can assign tasks. I can do all these things that you would have to come to one of our lovely training classes for. But you can put that into a how-to document right here. How to, cr how to create and edit a page. Same idea. A lot of people only read in Confluence. And, and they, they don't realize that it is a democratized information repository. So they can create their own content. They might not know how. And then also how to work with files and images. This would be one of those little additional things that you bump into over the course of using the tool that you realize that a lot of people don't know how to do. So therefore, you throw in another help document. Of course, the organization of this is extremely important. And you want somebody that has a very broad mind to the user base to curate these documents in an order and in a titling manner that makes sense. So that just depends on your organization. I know that one of the problems with documentation is as soon as you write it, it's out of date. So I tend to write little notes, little warnings up at the top. You know, Please check page history to see the last time this was updated to see if it's still useful for you. Um, this page will be updated on request, but will not be consistently updated. So you can put warnings like that to help you out. Then we come down to Jira user how-to articles. So you can break this down to various add-ons as well. If the add-on is mostly Jira focused, we could learn all about help for portfolio for Jira. So how to set up a portfolio plan. You could point managers to this, or you could point directors to this. Um, and then we get into things like, you know, just basic information about the tools. How are Jira projects structured? Maybe your subject matter experts really would like to know more about notification schemes and what they can do. So you can point them to this instead of having to have more of those hallway conversations. How to build a personal Kanban or Scrum board. This one's huge, right? I mean, that's one of the major benefits of Jira. And yet most people never realize that they need to share their filter. So maybe you could put that in big you know, blink text. Uh, luckily, Confluence does not support that. But uh, perhaps a warning text at the top. None of this will work unless you share your filter. Click on this page to find out how to share your filter. How to build a dashboard, same thing. Um, and giving examples. So you, you can create company-wide best practice examples and throw them into this company-wide confluence space. Uh, how, to, how to create a filter. Uh, common problems, why can't I see my data, my issues, my project. How to edit your user profile, although with the new privacy, that might not matter. Uh, and then you know various how-to articles, much like up here with, with portfolio, but these are, these are less used. Um, add-ons, for example, in this instance, or you know, structure for Jira help files if you use structure for Jira, as some of my coworkers who are watching right now do. So that is how-to articles in a nutshell. And you want to keep those up front because most people, when they come to this page, are looking for help. Um, going up the list, though, and this is the part that I really like. So obviously, these over here are mirrored with these over here. It just depends on if your users are savvy enough to use the sidebar versus the page. So here, we can come to governance structure. And this will explain all about how our governance works. Everything that Steve talked about before, all that information as it pertains to your company is here. So one of the things that we do when we go work with companies is we sit down in those small meetings, and we build this out with them. And it, it really is kind of an exciting process because people go, oh, yes, I know Joe is the guy to do this. He's going to be in this position. He can write this document for us. And we sort of build it right there. That's the magic of Confluence. It, it's collaborative. So you would have a page that would explain your Atlassian steering committee. And it would explain the purpose of it, the structure, the members. Uh, it would have meeting notes if you want. So Confluence has this neat functionality called meeting notes. It's a blueprint. You can basically log meeting notes, and then it stores them in a repository, so you can always reference back to them. So your ASC can have full documentation on what happened if minutes are very important to your company, which I imagine they are if you're a large company. Um, then we hop down into the uh, APAG group. So we have the Atlassian Products Administration Group. And again, the same thing, the purpose of it, the structure, the members, the meeting notes, tasks to be done, et cetera. If you don't know about tasks in Confluence, they're pretty fun, but you can also track them in Jira as well. And then we have the ASAG, and this is just a repetition of this. But of course, the members might uh, 
might switch out a little bit more for this. So you might just have a whole backlog of members sitting sitting in the in the wings waiting. And 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 specifically, this is really important. It actually explains, and I find this very very helpful uh, for some people. The difference between the system infrastructure and the UI based configuration, they might not know the difference. So you can point them here to understand which committee is handling which. Then, if you're not using uh, Jira to track all this stuff, which I'm going to show in a minute, let's not look at that, uh, you can track a decision log. So you can, uh, Confluence also provides a blueprint and then a stacking set of decisions, and you can store those within Confluence as well. Uh, to track all the major decisions that your committees have made. So we're going to this workflow now. We're going to scale JIRA in this way. We are no longer going, going to allow end users to close issues or whatever. That could all be tracked here if that works for your company. Then, of course, the ever important how to initiate a policy change, grassroots movements. I would like to make a change in my JIRA instance. I'm going to come here. I'm going to learn how. And then I'm going to start that process over in JIRA, which I'll show us in a minute. And then we have different committee responsibility areas. So depending on what your JIRA system is or how your Bitbucket is set up, uh, Bitbucket is set up you might have various uh, parts of the UI administration delegated out to different groups. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, maybe sometimes you want only a particular committee group to handle this versus a particular committee group to handle this. And they're all kind of mixed, it, mixed in together with JIRA. So we've broken those out here in our example. Any questions so far about the how-to articles, the governance structure, and how we're tracking this in Confluence? Cool. All right. So then we hit policies and standards. So I, just for me, I broke these up between administrators and all users. And the reason why is because a lot of the stuff that pertains to setting up JIRA really doesn't matter for the rest of the user group. But here are some examples. So how do we archive our projects as a company to respect our data retention policies? Um, I'm going re to rename this right now, and I'm going to, wow, that is embarrassing. I'm not going to rename that right now, but I would call this configuration element maintenance. So this is going to be all about how we, how we only do create projects on shared configuration within JIRA, or how we try to use as few schema as possible in our instance. Or when we do find superfluous uh, items, such as extra issue types, et cetera, you know, uh, how do we clean those up? And what are the rules for making a new issue type? Because we don't want all of our configuration elements to get so big that it's so arduous for the administrators to use. But this is all just admin focused. Then this is one of my favorites here, uh, breaking integrations that you need to be aware of when making changes. So for example, within our company, uh, all of our public classes are fed out of JIRA, all the data is in JIRA. And if you change a field name as an administrator, you will break our sales pages. So I've got a whole grid in our system that says what, what item in JIRA you have, and then what are the various applications that are reading from JIRA and then what things within there uh, will break and how to fix them if you break them. So we use an add-on called uh, Query Feed, which basically takes a JSON dump of whatever filter you have within JIRA, posts it, and then another application can read from it. So if I change, again, field names, if I change field values in those fields, that would be a problem. So pointing your, your administrators here, sort of a tread at your own risk if you're going to affect any of these. Then we have user access configuration. So this is how we do user access. This is how we manage our groups. Do we manage them internally or externally? And I'm sure we can think of 100 other things to add in here that are very important for administrators that nobody else really needs to know about. So if you want, you could use Confluence's, uh, Confluence's uh, page permissioning. You could even hide this particular tree from, from the rest of the users and only share it with the, Confluence, with the JIRA administrators or administrators group if you want, just to avoid clutter. And I might recommend that because for a lot of people, the less they see, the easier it is to go through, as opposed to piling them up with lots of information and overwhelming them. All right. Then we have policies and standards for everybody. Now, now if you're using scaled JIRA, or if you have, like, let's say, 50% uh, of your JIRA users are doing software development, and then you have, you know, little 10% groups here, they're using it for HR, 
or for you know uh, business processes or for marketing or sales. I might break these down into uh, into those groups because HR probably doesn't need to know about how our company has decided to do estimation, for example. Um, and you might not need to know the software hierarchy uh, for 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 software projects if you're over in HR. That's also up to you. So basically, policies and standards. That's because it's a mix. Uh, policies are things that we decided on as a committee, voted on and approved, and are now implementing. Standards are just kind of best practices that we don't want to forget. So we have our issue hierarchy. We also have um, permissions in portfolio. So if we have created various groups and um, we want people to know who are the intended members of those, so when they're building their plans, this is who we're going to put into these various groups. Because this is also confusing as well um, for things like roles within projects. Like if you're, if you're a software company, yeah, scrum master, product owner, developer, that's all very, very clear. But if you're the HR person and as an admin you have restricted the role namings because you because these are these are database wide roles or, or um, instance wide roles, I mean, uh, what is the scrum master in HR? So you might either need to create a new role name and just have people understand that that's out there, or you might need to translate that and point them to here when, when the project administrator is assigning those roles. Then we have policies for add-ons. This could be very, very broad. Uh, this could be the way that we add add-ons. This could be when or when, when, or when we don't do add-ons. Um, this could explain the process for the committee grassroots movement to implement an add-on. Or this could be policy specifically for specific add-ons. Obviously, for every company, it's going to be very different. Then we have statuses, resolutions, and priorities. Um, this is where I want to point all of my end users when they ask for a new status or a new resolution. Uh, we already have all of these. And of course, you can always click the question mark when you go to create an issue next to issue type, but nobody knows that. So you could either frequently update it or infrequently, it doesn't matter, update it here. Or you could say, you know, we have one. Re one resolution for complete is called done. We don't have resolved complete. We don't have resolved. We don't have complete. It's just done. And point people to that. Same with statuses. Here's a list of the statuses that, that, that we find the most useful. And maybe here's, a, here's an, um, an example of when we add new statuses upon request. Standard workflows. I think a lot of people, even though there's a there's a button on everyone's issue that says view workflow, I think a lot of people don't understand that they can view the workflow, or they might not be aware of the other workflows available. So if you have software teams that like to do UAT within their sprint, or if they like to do UAT in their release cycle, you could have two different workflows, one for each. That's something I do at a company right now. Um, however, m uh, uh, people might not have ever seen that other workflow. So you could post that here and make that available for them to decide between the two workflows if they find one more useful than the other. And they may see other workflows get inspired. Now, we'll get in later on within best practices about in a very large company, uh, you might want to restrict the workflows available. But in a small company, yeah, you really can create custom workflows for just about everybody. And, and pointing them here is, is quite helpful for that. Um, so policies in progress. Is kind of fun. This is a great way to use the old JIRA macro or a filter uh, macro. I'm not sure which one this is because I lost my license, so I couldn't actually tell you. <laughs> I have to tell, tell our guy in Poland about that. Um, but you know, here I've got a bunch of dummy issues uh, that are that are that are currently in progress. I think the filter is something like, you know, project is governance and resolution is empty. You know, and probably created after a certain date. So you can, um, if you if you have users that are not as familiar with Jira, you, you you can point them to this page and say, well, well, this is where this is where your thing is. Um, or of course, if they're used to Jira, you can have them watch a particular issue that they're inter interested in. So yeah, um, so that's the confluence side of things. Um, I started with that because for me, confluence really is. Uh, where where people come together to talk about processes, whereas Jira is where they come together to look at work in progress. Um, so I find that starting in Confluence when we work with clients is really the best way to start building these structures, you know, because we can write it out and draft it, and then we can put it into place over in Jira. Welcome back, everyone, uh, online and in person. So before the break, we talked about using Confluence to manage your Alaskan governance structure with the ASC and the APAG and the ASAG and the user groups. Uh, now we're going to talk about how to roll that into JIRA.
So I'm going to come over here to my fancy app switcher and go to Jira. All right, so the first thing I've done is created a dashboard, but really you should look at that at the end. So I'm going to go to workflows, and I'm going to talk about useful workflows with me uh, that, that you can use in Jira. So the idea is that you really want to, gosh, I've got to find these. All right, so we're going to go to view. All right, so let's talk about nominating people for a committee. That's an important activity. And the first thing we need to do is maybe have a workflow for it so we can track people through, through the nomination process. So we would create a ticket for the nominee, maybe write up some information about them. We'd go through the, uh, we would say, hey, we're nominating them. Go through the voting process. If they fail, they go back again. They get appointed. They maybe go through a, a quick onboarding. And then they're closed out, and now they are on the committee. Of course, you can do this in whatever situation you want to do for your own company. It doesn't matter. But running it through a workflow would make it really easy to track it and see how you're doing on that. Coming back here, let's talk about buying an add-on. Well, the whole, uh, after you've decided we're, we're going to buy it, uh, you maybe go through a validation step. You maybe go through bidding because purchasing gets involved in all of this. Then you go through the purchase order. Then you close it out. Maybe there is the step in here where you are uh, implementing the add-on. It's up to you. But this is one way to track when you're adding on new things to your Jira instance. Because why not? It provides visibility, and people understand where you're going. Let's go back. So then we have a policy change. This is one of the more fun ones. So you have a policy for your Atlassian applications, Jira, HipChat, Confluence, etc. And you want to make a change. So first of all, after you've gotten it approved, maybe, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's a different workflow. So we start out with our policy proposal. It gets drafted. It goes to review. Maybe there's a second review process that we use. Maybe it goes back to drafting because it fails the review first. Then it gets approved. Then it gets implemented. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what all the workflows are that I named for these because it was a little while ago that we did this. Just ignore those. Um, Steve, do you want to explain variance for a moment? Because as I, as I recall, this is where we track mistakes. Oh, we only have one microphone. All right, well, I'm going to do my best to explain. It's an event during the policy. Okay, so while you have a policy going on, if there's a problem, if that policy is broken for some reason, maybe you want to track instances of that. Um, maybe that's your company culture, maybe it's not. But if you have a variance in the policy, I, ca I call it an oops, uh, you could track it this way. So the problem happens, you investigate it, it gets reviewed. We then go modify the policy to make sure it doesn't happen again, or we do a corrective action or something in there. Um, I wouldn't use this to beat over people's heads. I would use it to just help track changes that are happening to say that, oh, yeah, this is obviously something that we didn't look at. That's OK. Let's not do that mistake again, or let's modify things so, so that our intention in that is good. So you can track policy variances that way. Um, where is the ah, user product request? That's, that's the best one right there. This is where we democratize add-ons. So hey, Joe user, you want a new add-on? That's fantastic. Come open one of these issues. And then it's on you to research it, find out if it's good or not, for instance. Then you need to gather interest. Then you're going to present it to the Atlassian Products Steering Committee. Um, if it's going to be on the roadmap, that's fine. But may maybe not for next year. It goes to on hold with a comment. Um, obviously, this is not a totally built out workflow because you'd never have a status that goes like that. But that's fine. Um, and then after that, after, after it gets approved, it goes to purchasing, which kicks off the other workflow that we already saw, where we go through the, the validation, the bidding, the installation, et cetera. Oh, I'm sorry, installation's here. After purchasing, it comes back here. And you can use automation to make that work, right? Of course, you can have uh, this step automatically create a purchasing issue type. Um, and then it runs through its workflow. And then when, it, then when it gets closed, it kicks back to configuration. And so now the admins are configuring it. They add some documentation into Confluence. Now it's closed out. So this is really the heart of the, can I say one oh, please do. Just get close to me so you can hear me. We're just going to stand next to each other. So, no. um, so what, the thing I really like about this workflow is it incorporates multiple aspects of what we talked about this morning, right? So here, 
we are we are actually gathering interest. This is the user who wants the the add-on that's out there talking to other users, right? So we don't have a top-down approach. We have a lateral approach to activity that's going on across users. Here we have it on hold. So if six months from now some other user says, "Gee, I wonder if I wonder if we're going to buy something like Jira Suite Utilities." He can go in and do some research to see if anybody ever submitted a request in the past to buy Jira Suite Utilities. He's going to find this thing that's been sitting out there for on hold for six months. He can go back to this guy and talk to him and say, hey, what happened with Jira Suite Utilities? Why did it go on hold? Then as we come around here, we're actually using a nested workflow, which is really cool. And then it comes into configuration. Now we're engaging the ASAG. We can actually set up the ASAG before this because we know it's going to come out of purchasing so that we can schedule them. And now we're actually incorporating our, um, our activities into our, into our governing body. And then documentation, of course. So the users are now the ones that are driving the documentation and the best practices and all of the elements that you want. So it's not your governing bodies that are actually having to do this. It's actually this, this whole grassroots type process. So that, that's one of the reasons why I really like this workflow, because it actually implements some of those really key features around it. Thanks, Steve. Any questions about that workflow? Because this is the one that we all really enjoy. Because it makes everyone's life up top a whole lot easier. All right. So what am I missing here? I think I'm still missing policy or annual policy. We, we did purchase policy change nominations. I think that's it. So now, once you have all, all, all those workflows and all those issue types in place, then you can build yourself a governance dashboard, which I have here. So let's make sure I talked about variance, user product quest, purchase, policy change, domination. Yes. So here you could track all of your in-process things. I think I think the filter here again is um, filtered by um, unresolved, and you can see where they are in their in their life cycle here. You could also I think run a status category here instead. So you could just do to do in progress done perhaps, um, or you could do a filter list instead if you prefer that kind of view. And then over here, um, depending on if you find you know any sort of st statistics interesting or not, you could see that you know 60% of things are in open and 40% are closed, or you basically track it by issue type within your governance project. And of course, all of these are what you saw fed back into the Confluence page earlier. So we'll just slow down there for a minute and enjoy this. So now, at one glance, you see all of your governance in process right here. And anybody that has any questions about it can come here, take a look at the dashboard, click into the issue, find out what's going on. So if we go to nomination, we can go find out, oh, look, I'm being nominated for the ASAC. How, how neat. Um, yeah. Or if we have a purchase, we can find out about that. So somebody wants to add structure for Jira, it's in to-do. We all know where that lives now. So any questions about that? I, I, I think this is particularly yeah, cool. For, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we also have one that we build sometimes called annual policy. And let me see if I, if I made that issue type. It's not on the dashboard, but that's because it's not really something that you track. So it's an issue type that uh, encompasses the policies for an entire year. And if you're going to have a policy change for next year, you could stack it up on next year's annual policy. And you could link all these issues in a hierarchy to that annual policy. And that workflow is just you know, open, closed, or maybe backlog, open, closed. So, so that anybody at any time can click into annual policy and then see all of the current policies enacted there. And then you could dump those onto a confluence page as well to see all of the actual voted on you know, committee approved policies as opposed to the best practices and standards that we talked about earlier. These are actually things that got decided by committee. And then you can also wrap them all up in an annual version too if you want. So we all know that in JIRA you use versions to sort of timestamp collections of issues across a period of time. You could use a version as well for that. So sort of out of the box ways to use JIRA to track other processes. Um, obviously, we use these a lot for like HR processes as well. We use them to uh, onboard instructors. So why not use it for your company policies? All right, so that's all the JIRA stuff. And for the next 30 minutes or so, I was going to talk about a series of best practices that we use. Um, 
we talk about a lot of these in our in our Jira bootcamp, but these are more aimed at governance. So uh, I'll start with that. So first of all, <laughs> the number one is reduce the number of administrators. I'm sure that we all have horror stories of either walking into a borrowed instance or something else with 30, 40, 50 administrators, or where everybody is an administrator, in which case nobody really is. Um, so the very first thing that we do is highly recommend that everybody reduce administrators. And we have kind of a rough ratio. What is it like? One or two for every thousand users, um, but it but it's not a it's not a straight line, um, and you just throw on more FTEs as as the overhead becomes greater. But um, by doing that, you really avoid like like in in some companies that I work with, I'm always amazed suddenly when a new add-on pops up and somebody asks me about it. Like I have no idea what that add-on is, even though I'm one of the main fraud administrators. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Let me go in the logs and find out who installed it and go ask them. So yeah, reducing the number is extremely helpful. Um, the other thing to do that we already talked about is maintain admin documentation. Uh, these are the changes that I made internally. Even administrators could just post in that part of the Confluence space um, and, and sort of keep track of why and how they're making the changes. So uh, command intent, which is a great military example of you know, if, 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 if people know the why, uh, they can make good decisions absent leadership. So if you know why we're making this change or why we make changes like this, the next time I don't have to go ask you. I just know the general intent here, and I can go make an appropriate change in line with that general intent. Um, we also like to keep a folder of most commonly used links. This is just me as an admin, but uh, for me, I keep a Jira folder right here that has all of the most commonly used um, settings pages and things that I'm always having to tweak. This is more of, more of a developer, like I just hate clicking mice so many times things, so I use that for most of what I do. Uh, projects, project standards. So we recommend always using uh, shared configuration when making a new project so you don't get all of those config elements dumped into your Jira backend. Uh, of course, when there is uh, the first time you make a project, you'll have to make it based on a standard template, that's okay. And maybe the first time that you make a brand new project, and if you don't have configurations made for it yet, you could do the create from template. But we do strongly recommend that you go and clean up all the garbage afterwards. Maybe you set a policy that every couple months an admin goes through and cleans things up. But then you also get into the question of outcome versus output. Is it really worth going and cleaning it up if it's not really slowing you down? And as I said before, I love a clean house more than anything. But at the same time, it might just be wasting my time to go and hunt down every unused screen. Um, or maybe when, when the company has a down cycle, then I go do that. But for the most part, it's you know, keeping prod alive and helping end users. Um, using an archive category and a permission scheme for online archiving, this is a pretty standard practice. But like small companies, when they're first starting out, they might not know about that. Maybe you would have two archiving permission schemes. One is read-only and one is hidden. Uh, that would be very helpful for the users that are transferring from old projects to new projects but still want to keep their data. For example, if you're scaling Jira and you, and you have a new series of templates that you're using, keeping their old data read-only is very helpful for them. Um, on export, this is a fun one that if you've ever done a full project export and you didn't look into this, you might have made a mistake. Um, making sure that you're in the right permission scheme and, and all of the security schemes associated with that, um, or uh, all the security levels associated with that project so that you don't miss out on anything in a CSV export. Uh, that's something that if you don't set up your system so that, ad, so that admins can always see everything all the time, which I think most people don't set it up that way because there's always you know, project X that nobody's supposed to look at. But remembering to go in and make sure that you reset yourself for the permissions when you're doing a backup is very important. Um, using a test project in prod, yeah, this is all standard stuff uh, that has its own, uh, its own config elements, its own screens, its own workflows, its own issue types, et cetera. Um, unless, you have a, unless you have a test prod model where you only make changes in test and then push them, uh, I always keep a prod test project. It's called Brian's test project. It's high in the alphabet. I can find it very easily. All the elements are named after me as well, so I can find them and tweak them very quickly to do user test cases, for example. All right, talking about roles now. So project roles, I think that if you have a small company uh, and if you are able to have all of those good conversations with your, with your um, fellow coworkers, you can really push out administrative responsibilities to the project administrators. So one thing that we do with very small companies is we have notification-based roles. So notify on everything, notify only on create, notify on updates, notify on comment. 
And then the project administrator can actually go in and add people to that role so that we're not tweaking um, notification schemes because you might have individuals that want to see everything. We have some of those in our company. And you might have people that only want to know the big stuff. So you can do that out by role. You can also do permissioning out by role as well. So you would have a role that is view all issues, a role that is view only assigned issues. Uh, you could have a role that is can can edit and transition, but can't close issues. For example, it just kind of depends on the on the way you break up work in your company. Now, I would not suggest that at all for a large company because for a large company to have to go train every new project admin on how to do that, it would be way more work than it saves. So for that, you know, standardization and the the snarky line that I don't tell people, but is if you want a custom workflow or custom notifications, go work for a small custom company. You are working for a giant corporation. We have standards, unfortunately. I don't say that. I say, this is the way it is, and let me help you with it. Um, resolution, statuses, priorities, and links. Oh my gosh, please pare them down if you can. All of those. Again, resolutions. I can't tell you the number of redundant resolutions that I, that I roll into, and it becomes so incredibly confusing for, for the end user. And it makes it hard later on to do reporting on your issues, too, because was it, was it complete, done, or resolved no issues? I, yeah, so having, having a policy documented ahead of time for your administrators or making sure that your administrators have been trained to not add a resolution for every individual user's needs is huge. Same goes for statuses, same goes for priorities. Um, now that we have priority schemes, this has been a lot easier, um, but still, you don't want to have everything cluttering up the database. Also, issue link types. Um, Jira is pretty good out of the box. I don't know many more that have to be added. Some add-ons have to have to have additional ones, but if you can, keeping those as standard as possible so that they don't duplicate any 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 other link type, it's just going to make your end user's life a whole lot easier later on. I'm sure we all have bad stories about that too. Uh, issue types. Try not to keep your business logic here. So uh, um, I've seen a lot of places where where they have you know project and team specific issue types even. And this is of course before people know about custom fields or before they know about you can put more than one issue type in a project. I just, it's, it's, it's amazing the lack of knowledge that leads to creating so many issue types that are redundant. So um, keeping one issue type called support works for many, many, many different team types. And if you really need to break out more than one support uh, ticket within a project, okay, then you might want to consider going to another one. But but basically naming things generically across the board is really helpful because people can usually infer and a little bit of training and norm normalization goes, goes a long way for not having to make all these extra uh, config elements in the database. Uh, only, uh, only add a new issue type to a project when you need a new workflow or a new set of screens or a new set of required fields. This is very standard Jira knowledge, but something to remember. You don't need an extra issue type to differentiate between the same kind of work that you're doing. You, you really only need it if you need a new workflow. Otherwise, a managed custom field with a dropdown would handle that differentiation very clearly for you. Uh, if you need a hierarchy, of course, uh, portfolio and structure are both two great add-ons that will give you a hierarchy uh, beyond just the standard Jira epic story. Any questions so far? This might be all common knowledge so far, um, but I think for some people watching, it might be some of this might be new and hopefully very helpful. All right, moving on. Workflows, ops bar sequence. Do we all, do we all know about the ops bar sequence uh, property in a workflow? You can basically control uh, where, where the transition appears in what order. Uh, I use um, not necessarily a Fibonacci sequence, but I always go by 10, 20, all the way up to 100. So let me, um, I'll just try to explain this visually. So starting at the beginning of the workflow, Every transition, I start with 10, and then 20, and 30, and 40, and 50, all the way up to 100. Hopefully, there's not more than 10 transitions, unless you have a very custom workflow. Then for all the ones going backwards, I start at 110. So 110, 120, or sorry, 110, 120, 130. And what this does is it leaves gaps in the middle for me to add new transitions if I need to without going and reorganizing all these ops bar numbers, because it's a real pain. And then if I have any separate global transitions that are like cancel or something, I kick those all the way out to 1,000. So they always appear all the way at the end of the, of the workflow dropdown within your issue types. That's just something that helps my life go a little bit easier. Maybe it'll help yours too. Um, epic status. Don't forget to set epic status if you have an epic workflow. Uh, that's a fun surprise. 
where where people close an epic and it looks closed in the in the in the backlog panel, but surprise surprise, it's still sitting in to do in the workflow. So mapping epic status and status changes within a workflow are very important. If you need more help on that? Give us a call. We can explain that to you. Um, Pairing down resolution options. I find this to be really helpful. Um, so you can use uh, Jira resolution include or Jira resolution exclude properties on, on your um, closing transitions. Uh, I usually start workflows by giving people just two options, done or canceled, when they resolve an issue. Because in, in most instances, we don't let people delete issues for data retention reasons, ex except for admins. So always giving somebody a canceled option is very important. And pairing down res resolution options just to those two just helps them work a little bit faster. If you want to be really kind, if you have a small custom team that needs a small custom workflow, you could even do different transitions for those so they don't, ha so they don't have to select it. But that's a lot of work. Um, cl clearing, clearing resolutions on workflows that have all global transitions, that's a it's kind of a rookie mistake, but one that we see all the time. Uh, people forget that if you have many global transitions out of closed, every single one of those has to clear the resolution. Otherwise, you're going to have um, statistics problems later on. Issues are going to look closed that are actually open. Using a version system uh, and describing the changes. So workflow, you know, instructor onboarding 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 1.3, and maybe keeping those old workflows for a while. It's, it, it is useful to see the history and the evolution of those workflows as an administrator to see why you maybe don't want to go back to another workflow in the past. Um, something to note, at least on server, this is a problem. I don't know if they fix this on cloud, but if you have, um, you know how when you have multiple statuses in one column in a Kanban board or in a, or in a um, Scrum board, the order of the transitions that appears has nothing to do with the order that they appear in the Kanban configuration in the column. It has to do with the order they were created when you made the workflow. And this is a bug that might be fixed later on in JIRA, but this is a fun one when you have, let's say, a canceled global transition and a complete global transition. To get the complete one to appear on top, you may have to go rebuild the workflow from scratch. This is one that I've experienced a few times now already. Uh, you can stack global transitions, one on top of another. Uh, if you go to text in the, in the workflow editor, you can create a new transition, and you can actually have multiple global transitions go to the same status with different labels if you need, setting different resolutions. Um, you might want to give project administrators simplified workflows when possible, because then you can send them out on their way to make their own workflows, and they will never bother you again until they need custom transitions. So that one's quite helpful. Um, yeah, whenever I can take administrative overhead and push it out, much like I don't control my own capillaries, I let my body figure that out for me. Uh, if I can send out work out to project administrators, that's a whole lot easier for, for, for everybody because they're closer to the work, they know what's going on. Um, and also using back to transition labels. So a lot of people, um, I think in the, interest, in the interest of brevity, they make somewhat cryptic transition labels. And saying back to to indicate that you're taking a step back in the workflow is quite helpful for helping people understand where they actually are in a workflow and that that transition is not going the right way. Questions so far? All right. Notifications. Here's a fun one. Uh, if you leave JIRA notifications on it as they're out of the box, people will pretty quickly start making filters and ignore all JIRA notifications, especially because of the notify reporter one. That's really great for a product owner and sometimes for a project manager, but in general, having reporter on the default notification scheme seems to create a lot of uh, unnecessary email for a lot of people, especially when somebody creates a bunch of issues. They don't care about it, but they're, but they're now the reporter, and now every single change gets kicked back to their inbox. So I tend to start by changing the default to watchers and, assign and assignee only. That seems like the most logical set of users that want to know if changes are made to an issue. And then if teams need custom notifications after that, then I go build reporter. Or I you know, notify on the, on the product owner role, because maybe they want to see all the changes within their, um, within their project. Um, so yeah, start small. And, and this is true for everything, workflows, notification schemes, permission schemes. Start with what you need, and then go out and customize as the need grows. You'll probably save yourself a lot of wasted time trying to guess what, you, what your users need, instead of just waiting for them to tell you. Now, of course, you don't want to go too far down that road and not make any 
uh, useful changes in the beginning, but usually people will let you know pretty quickly what they need. And, and they'll let you know when they need it too, which is important. They might not read they might not know that they need an in-review status until they actually need it. And when the need arises and you make it for them, it becomes much more useful for them. All right, naming configuration elements. Um, this is just kind of administrator standard activities, but, but purposefully and consistently, consistently label things and have policies for this. So for example, um, I always label things with you know, WFS workflow scheme, WF workflow, like just on the end of the name, ITSS issue type screen scheme. Uh, this helps administrators, particularly slightly newer ones, remember where they are in the configuration. If they're staring at it and you know, I'm making changes, why, why isn't this working? Oh, it's the workflow, not the workflow scheme. I need to go change that too. So it's just a nice little naming tag that helps people remember where they are in the setup. Um, when I, when I do labels on elements, though, I do things that are, if it's project specific and project specific only, I'll start with a project key and then a colon. So for example, on a screen, um, inq colon create slash edit slash view. This is very clear. This is the one screen that's used for everything within this project. Or if I have multiple projects that cover a similar business purpose, I do the business purpose colon create slash edit slash view. So inquiries create edit view and maybe I have multiple inquiries projects. And this just helps people find the stuff later on in the database. It's just much, much clearer. Um, I also make reusable screens right off the bat, transition col colon comment only, transition colon resolve, transition colon assign, transition colon link. That's quite helpful. Senior uh, solutions uh, engineer for DevOps, but across uh, the four and a half years I've been here at Atlassian, I've played various advocacy and evangelism roles around uh, software development. Uh, in the first role that I had about four and a half years ago, I was on a team with uh, some of the uh, longest at, at Atlassian developers on that developer advocacy team. So, um, so a lot of this story comes from either uh, discussions with them or uh, in um, exploring our own confluence spaces to understand our, our history. So I'm connecting this up to uh, governance in a, in a kind of different way than, than we have in some of the, uh, the earlier talks. So nominally, this is about uh, uh, JIRA and, and some of the associated products have moved from monolith to microservices. But along the way, we've had to discover some, some ways to uh, govern those applications, uh, new ways to look at security. And so we'll pause across, uh, across this journey and, uh, and, and, and have some conversation about what those were. Uh, so I don't know, do, do, um, do any, do, I don't know how many people would yes. remember this 1966 yes. film? Yes. Okay, so this is, you know, like a team of scientists are shrunk down to fit inside a human body. But I fear this model of, of miniaturization is how too many developers think about microservices, right? So we've got our big server. We'll just shoot the right ray at it and shrink down the microservice. And, and it's, it's as if the, the term microservice is focusing us on the, the wrong aspect, like it's the size uh, only about microservices that matters. I, I think what's uh, really important is, is how microservices fit together. And so it's really about the system, the, the, the larger whole, and I'm not even sure that this idea of system goes far enough that more and more these days, applications depend on things outside of our own company. They depend on, um, you know, a, a public facing website has uh, different services it uses for authentication. Uh, there's another system that it's using for customer tracking and something else for financial data. And so there's a whole world of services with APIs to leverage. And so maybe a better term is ecosystem. So, so I, you know, I'm going to kind of draw some attention to this. We'll, we'll circle back at the end and kind of discover how that fits in, especially with uh, governance and security. So uh, to go way, way back in, in history for uh, Atlassian, Jira is uh, the, the first product that our, our founders uh, came up with. Uh, probably not in 2002 exactly. They spent a little bit of time doing a, a, a service offering, trying to do support for another customer. Uh, um, but, and, and at the time, I don't know if, uh, if Jira could have been written any other way. 
so many of you be, you know, may, may be thinking if you're starting today, you know, why would you even start with, with microservices? Um, like, and, and if you are, you may already be thinking like, hey, and we regret it. Like, you know, if, if you're starting out, you, you know, oh man, I want to tear these things apart. But I, I you know, this, this story isn't about regrets. I, you know, what I think is that like as uh, products get started, they, they really need to get out there and make sure that they're solving some real customer problems before they start worrying a whole lot about uh, architecture or starting over with microservices. Uh, so, but the rest of the story is really how we have adapted and evolved our architecture over time and some of the choices that we had to do the same. And I think if we can get there, that means other people can too. Uh, so if anything, I hope this story helps you do some of those transitions in less time and, uh, and there's no reason to just wallow in regret about your monolith. Um, so, so, okay, so when we started out, we were pretty uh, you know, like pathological case of a monolith. Uh, if, if those of you who remember JSP, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the frame of mind people were in. It was like pour all of the business logic into a page and that's, you know, that's how you build an app. Um, but I actually, it wasn't even that great. At least JSPs, you can kind of make changes on the fly and, and you know, you, you don't necessarily have to restart the application. But it was certainly the case with Jira that if you wanted to make a change, you had to bring the application down, uh, restart it, um, reinstall, re restart, and all of that. Um, so for its day, that's, that's kind of pretty much the norm. But when we were shipping it, we really you know, had a lot of customers who wanted to do a lot more than it did out of the box. Uh, as Mike uh, mentioned, that Jira was actually a kind of reaction to Bugzilla and for uh, that code base, that's something that people were customizing uh, quite heavily through uh, just like, you know, changing the scripts. So, uh, so we shipped Jira as, as kind of open-ish source and in fact continue to, to do that to this day, which means if you're an existing customer, you can get access to our source code. Uh, but initially, this was the only way that customers could do any kind of modification to the product itself. Uh, and so, I don't know, if, if you imagine that, you know, that back in the day when you're having to bring that down, make, you know, make some changes and then bring it back up again, that's an onerous development loop. But it's one that we actually forced on our customers if we're telling them this is the way that you customize your application. So, um, yeah, so, so I think, you know, like it took us a while to, uh, to kind of catch up and, and realize that this was not the right way to do things. It was, uh, yeah, at least a couple of years of living in this world. And there were um, some real upsides to that. Even, you know, like even just shipping the open source and letting customers modify their own code, uh, it, it certainly did let customers scratch their own itch. So that's an upside. Uh, our Atlassian devs then could focus on, on the sort of 90% use case. We're just really trying to focus, you know, like uh, solve for the broadest possible uh, case. It certainly meant for stickier products as customers were able to change the product and make it do what they needed it to do. Uh, they, they were, you know, all the more loyal customers. And we started to find that devs who customize evangelize. This is kind of early days of uh, you know, developer relations kinds of thinking, but these, you know, Jira was a product for developers more or less. And uh, so those, you know, those developers, when they customized it, would tell other developers how great it was. So, and, and hence led to our spread. But there was certainly a downside. So the customization became, especially over, you know, a couple years, led to some customers that just simply could not get to the latest version. There was no way they could merge their, their code changes back together. Um, and, and like the, there was considerable pain about building the entire product that we were then forcing onto our customer base. Uh, overall, it led to a, a, a poor, I use the word plugin, but it, you know, like, you know, without having some kind of notion of of what customers might do to our product, uh, they would do anything. And so we had customers blaming us, or rather end users blaming us for a bad product experience that was actually given to them by their administrators. Uh, I, that might even happen a little bit today, but uh, you know, like imagine how much customization could have been done with just, you know, with only source code. And, uh, and overall, the, you know, like uh, the, that meant a support load that continued to climb and not just a support load that could be handled by any support engineers, 
but uh, had to be escalated to our developers. And so um, that was a real burden that we uh, really just couldn't handle. So that brought us into a new age, but, but before I move on, uh, like let's pause and think about the security concerns because we'll return to the security idea a few times. Um, pretty much, you know, this, this was a day and an age of, of, of self-managed so software. So our opinion was, was kind of the same as, as any other software that you might uh, buy. And it was, you buy it, you run it. Not, not quite the modern idea that we have of you build it, you run it. But, uh, and that meant, you know, we weren't giving a lot of concern to the security of that application. It was something we expected you to run behind your firewall, and if you wanted to expose it to the world, well, that's on you. So that brings us to 2004. Uh, Confluence and, and Jira were both, uh, you know, we, we, Confluence had kind of grown up in those couple of years. And the first generation of plugins came along. Uh, we, we, we use this term uh, service provider interface. I'll explain that in a bit. But that's a, a little bit narrower than, than just general APIs that you can use to customize some products. Um, I'd, I'd characterize what we had then as a naive plugin system because we wrote it from scratch. It was just like, hey, we have to uh, get beyond letting customers uh, modify this code. But that started getting us into an approach where our own development was uh, more of a modular monolith. So at least we were starting to carve out parts that could be characterized as, as uh, plugins. A, a bit more, um, I don't know, so I, I guess some folks would consider these terms put together a, an oxymoron. Uh, but I still think it's a good milestone for anybody who has a monolith now to start figuring out how to break out parts of what they have and be able to assemble them. Uh, now, it didn't solve all of our headaches, uh, you know, like for, for, for Jira, the, the application still had to be restarted to, in, to add new plugins. Um, but since the addition of plugins became a matter of changing the, the class path, at least the recompile cycle could be much shorter for, uh, uh, for targeting a plugin. So I don't know, any, anybody remember Jira 3? Yeah. So, um, yeah, this, <laughs> yeah. You can see how far things have come these days. So, so what were plugin points? Plugin points were uh, something like the menu that you have across the top there, and our kind of realization that hey, you know, there are certain targets within the user interface where people want to extend what you can do there. Okay, so if you take that to its logical conclusion, all right, there's another set of things: the uh, the user actions. Uh, there's another one over there with the kinds of views that people have, or another one in terms of which columns are available, or down there with the issue types. Okay, so there are certain targets, and we called them web fragments. They were places where you can extend the user interface. All right, so now, uh, just, you know, like, I don't know, trigger warning if you are sensitive to source code. Uh, it's about, about to show, show some source code, but in kind of, you know, very dumbed down uh, HTML, we would have had just like hard coded links for the various options in a, um, in a menu and then converted that in order to have a plugin system where there's an interface that has basically the text part of that. What are you going to see when you look at it and the link? And then implement that in Java code that, uh, you know, for some given set of text. Here's the href, and then there's the string that would map to it. So um, then we would change the code that looks like this to have more of an iterative loop so that it would go over all of the plugins, pick up the text that you're going to show, you know, put that into the right place, and then know what it points to. Okay, so. This gets me to that explanation of what that SPI is, so um, or, or service provider interface. So if in general terms, an API is the application programming interface, something that uh, you can do inside of source code to change the way the application behaves, then a service provider interface is, is a, nor, a, a more narrow idea that lets you add some functionality to the host application. Uh, Facebook apps have great, are, are kind of good example of this. Uh, you write some kind of app, something like Farmville. It's embedded into the Facebook user interface. Uh, to end users, it looks and feels like a Facebook feature. 
uh, but it's actually a separate application that's implemented as, as part of Facebook's service provider interface. So again, you, you know, the big idea is API is kind of a big thing, SPI is this specialization, but both share this word interface. Uh, and, and that's where some of the intent comes in. Um, so I guess one of the things that I would like call out here is what, what eff effectively separates the two is an idea of replaceability. So that means that we can unplug uh, a service provider interface, a plugin, and plug in a new one and get some kind of new behavior. So that interface idea is, you know, like really helped uh, solve some uh, problems for us. We have uh, e easier customization by end users now, much smoother upgrades. People can keep up. Uh, they just have to add the uh, add-ons again. There's more consistency in the user interface. At least we're just kind of adding the, you know, new elements to the same, uh, to the same rows. Uh, modular architecture and much simpler to implement for people who wanted to make changes to their own uh, application. Uh, but then there are some technical details that made that still a little bit painful. Uh, shared class path meant high coupling between, inter uh, between um, plugins. So if an add-on wanted to add something to the menu and then something to some user options, they had to know about each other directly. There was also no real public API delineation. So nothing to say like, okay, so these are the places where it's okay for you customers to extend the interface and where we want to, um, you know, like we don't want you to change things. And then there's still this need to restart to install plugins and we weren't using a standard plugin model. Uh, it just, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that easy to do. Um, okay, so in terms of governance, I come back to like the idea of you know governance as as a set of constraints. So rather than constraints on on human behavior, these were constraints we were putting into the um, in, you know like into the code itself. But it unlocked a, a, a fledgling ecosystem. Like this is really when Jira's ecosystem started to to expand, and there's a you know I, I think it kind of established a precedent even that that is still true today. So if you buy it you govern it. So now we're kind of into this, you know, like some of the, the big conversations are um, about governing the, the, the kinds of plugins that you uh, put in there. So one of the uh, customers that I was talking to recently, I, 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 I you know, I had to kind of tell them we, ha we have to get a hold of the, the plugin use here. You're approaching 200 plugins. That's an awful lot. Let's start saying no to adding more. And uh, so, so uh, or, you know this customer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and, or, you know, you have to start saying no to some of these requests or even reducing that. And do you know what the Jira admin asked? Is there a plugin for that? Right? So there's this, you know, that's the kind of mindset of like, you know, plugins are these wonderful tools, but uh, they can get you in some governance trouble if, you, you know, like if you aren't following some of the guidance we were talking about here. Uh, but I think the key here is that this, you know, like there's the, there's an idea about uh, governance that, you know, like constraints can be useful things that can help people, that you kind of help your uh, processes and um, uh, behavior scale a lot faster. And, and that's how we have unlocked this uh, wonderful ecosystem we have. Okay, so we get into the 2007 era and our products are starting to explode. We had acquired uh, Bamboo, uh, Crus Crucible, and Fisheye. And, uh, and, and, you know, like we, we still wanted to have this marketplace experience, but we really did, you know, we needed to get beyond a lot of those developer pains that uh, were preventing us from going further. So P2 uh, grew up in this era, or Plugins 2. It's an OSGI based uh, dynamic loading, dependency isolation, I don't know, without kind of dwelling too much in the details, it did allow, it did overcome some of the pains about restarting the system uh, when you had to make changes. So made for faster developer loops and a much better user experience where you could add the plugins uh, without having to restart the system. So that gets us into a service oriented monolith. So now things are actually quite a bit more separate. Rather than being just carve outs or cutouts inside of the uh, application, these are, um, really kind of separate things that you can build. They had their own development pipelines. So we could um, uh, b 
build them separately without having to rebuild the whole application. Uh, I gotta mention this, that, that a lot of that came from the benefits of OSGI. Uh, what it stands for won't help you understand what it is. Uh, so OSGI is the Open Service Gateway Initiative. Um, but if, uh, you know, I, I know it's kind of fallen out of favor, but if folks know Eclipse, uh, the Eclipse IDE was uh, built very much on OSGI and uh, um, I don't know, does some things that we'll show in the next couple slides kind of quickly again. Hopefully it won't uh, trigger too much reaction. The, um, you know, so, so the idea is like in, in Java world, you have these dependencies between plugins. Uh, they are usually manifest on the, um, on the class path. So you, you, you kind of what you are pointing to is fixed by what happens when you start up the, the JVM. Uh, what happens uh, is that uh, in, in the OSGI world is that you actually declare what those dependencies are in a manifest. And uh, so when a plugin starts up, it looks at its manifest and then uses that to resolve uh, which uh, dependencies that it has. Uh, right, so, um, so th th I, this kind of adds a kind of overhead that the original plugins didn't have, but a flexibility of that you don't have to restart things. So um, yeah, we get into this kind of interesting um, cycles where if you have, one of the things about the class path is that if you have two versions of this, uh, two different versions of the same thing like common lang. Uh, OSGI knows how to handle that so that you, you, know, you don't have to do as much um, keeping up all of the, the sets of uh, jars or libraries that you have to the same version. All right, so that gets us into, okay, we had a pane with shared class path, no public API de delineation, a need to restart and install plugins, and a non-standard plugin model. Well, OSGI helped us with uh, the shared class path took that problem away. No API delineation. Part of that uh, idea of the manifest is it declares what is a public API. Uh, the need to restart uh, plugins is just a feature of the OSGI itself. And OSGI is a standard plugin model. Okay, so, so mostly we, we were, P2 addressed all of the problems that we had in that old model. Uh, and, and one of the things that really helped us achieve was real independence in the, in the build pipelines themselves. So now we had different teams that could work on different parts. And that really allowed us to get to uh, a different place in terms of shipping products. So I, were, were folks around for the JIRA 7 release? We kind of remember maybe uh, switching our, our product offering from just the big JIRA to now several flavors of JIRA, JIRA software, JIRA service desk being the biggest there. And the important difference there is that like, we, you know, we needed that separation to be able to have different business models for these products without a kind of technical separation that we could do with, uh, with OSGI, we really wouldn't have been able to license that uh, in a different way. Uh, okay, so at, at this point, the plugin architecture was was starting to mean something different to us. We're getting over these developer headaches, um, but we wanted to become a, a cloud company in this era, right? So we're talking about between 2007, 2014. Uh, you mentioned you've seen some of the iterations we've done in cloud. So a lot of those first attempts were just take our uh, self-managed product and put it into the cloud. Uh, Customers had already by this time come to depend on plugins very heavily. Uh, the, the, you know, you wouldn't just value Jira on the merits of it, you know, it alone. It had a lot to do with the kinds of possibilities that were available for marketplace applications. Um, so at a t for, for a very short time, we did run Jira in our cloud with plugins that you could add. And uh, the overhead was just absolutely crushing. Uh, so we could, like, and, and we couldn't really rely on that kind of self-hosted argument, well, you bought it, so you secure it. Uh, you know, like if a plugin were leaking data or exposed the application to exploitation, that's on us because we were offering this as a service. So the P2 kind of model had, had you know, really reached a limitation when it came to cloud. 
And that brings us into this kind of like around the 2014 era is when we came out with a, a new approach, cloud-centric called Atlassian Connect. Uh, by this time, we had uh, HipChat. So we're all remembering HipChat these days. Uh, we, we do still have Bitbucket, um, Confluence, and Jira had made their way to cloud as well. And why did we do, do this? Well, so we've got these SaaS products, and in order to secure them, we need to be able to run third-party code in, in an out-of-process way. If it's in process, that means it has access to things that maybe it shouldn't. We wanted to be able to continue to improve the, the user experience, so we wanted to take all of those lessons from old plugins and, and see how we could uh, you know, step, that, step up our game there. And then we definitely needed to pay attention to cloud architecture, the, you know, what, what things are happening on the web. So building up cloud, uh, or sorry, um, Atlassian Connect is a, a layer on top of the old plugin model, model at least in, uh, in technical terms uses the same marketplace to serve up the, the apps, so there's a lot of reuse there. P2 apps are still available for those who are doing server and, and data center, as, as you probably well, well know. In the cloud, the same REST APIs are still uh, available for both server and cloud, so there's commonality there. And Connect provides an, an really just kind of a new model of integration, so not, not just extensibility the way that plugins did, but new ways to connect to uh, third-party cloud services. And how does it do that? So a module is called, uh, you know, or, sorry, when, whenever a module is called, let a third party inject a new feature. So I'll circle back. If you remember the earlier concept, we called that ability to extend things a web fragment. And we kind of really exploded that idea. So this is an, uh, some some code a, a, that you would use to describe an add-on in the new world. So this describes where an add-on is hosted, which is a, a web service, which modules it uses. Modules are those web fragments. And then scopes, and this really gets us into starting to secure things. So we have these idea that your app now has to ask for what kind of access it wants to uh, to the to the Atlassian application. And then some kind of authentication also, so that third-party applications can recognize the JIRA user uh, or, or Confluence user that it wants to talk to. Uh, so, and, and all of this is done, uh, it's kind of a subtle thing here, but this is all done descriptively. This is, you know, this is code in a sense, but it is also just declarative code. Uh, it, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you have to write in Java. So that has opened things up for other people to build on as well. Um, so I think a long ago we, we looked at Java and OSGI as the development platforms and we were finding we needed, you know, like much more uh, support for, for when we work with third-party integrators uh, that, that Atlassian Connect now provides a kind of platform for anybody to build on that isn't just based on Java or this, you know, crazy OSGI thing. So, and, and inwardly, we were starting to build new things as services as well. So, uh, around this age, we were starting to put some common telemetry across all of our products in uh, something that we were calling logging as a service. Uh, there's also, this is, this is when we started to build out some of the, uh, the first attempts at Atlassian ID. So, an, uh, a, a layer of authentication of user identity that would work across all of the products. Uh, and it, and it would eventually evolve into something that could support SAML SSO. So again, you know, helping with uh, end user security. And, and also we were starting to peel away some, some different features, uh, you know, even as we worked uh, with the same source code bases between server and data center, we were replacing some of the things that we were shipping to customers for storing things like attachments with something that would better fit in the cloud, a, a, a sort of media service. Uh, that you know, let, let that lets us take in things like Office Docs and PDFs and images and, and put them into Jira and Confluence. Okay, so it's about this age when we were thinking about webhooks, uh, or sorry, about uh, features as microservices. And as an example, if if you know, but Bit, Bitbucket was a pipeline or uh, platform that we were building on. Uh, we built the feature of Bitbucket pipelines 
as its own separate microservice, and the ability of Bitbucket to emit webhooks also as a microservice. So this is really starting to diverge from the way that our on-premise products work, which is which continues to be very um, monolithic. So this is also the era in which Atlassian goes public. So that's not that long ago, um, you know, but that subjected us to additional uh, scrutiny at the financial level, and that translates into a layer of technical governance that, uh, that you know, private companies often don't have to worry about. For example, Sarbanes-Oxley requires us to uh, have IT controls so that any software change that might have a, a fiscally, uh, you know, financially material impact uh, goes, um, you know, like, well, at least, you know, like, we know what happened, when it happened, who did it. Um, and as a software company, that, that's it's kind of scary because it means, like, what we sell to customers is our software. That pretty much means every change is subject to those kinds of regulations. So I know a lot of organizations, when they kind of hit this, one of the ways that they attack this, this kind of governance issue is with a traditional separation of duties. Uh, that's where you, a lot of times the interpretation is dev can't touch production and ops can't make source code changes. But we decided we really wanted to work with our auditors to help them understand that, you know, the, the, the kind of automated approach that we wanted to take. So we do have a kind of separation of duties, one that like, you know, makes sense to auditors, but isn't necessarily in terms of the separation of dev and ops. Uh, it's more about if somebody can make a change, they can't delete the record of that change. And, and that's also a kind of classic auditing approach. Um, and we also built in automation into our CI CD pipeline that would detect and prevent in inappropriate actions like code changes that weren't reviewed and approved by peers. And once our auditors understood how we were doing all of this, they were actually quite pleased because the controls that, that we have put in place are often more effective than the kinds of manual controls that, that some other companies have. So um, a lot of this comes out of, you know, kind of a, a lot of this, the, the technical things that we put in place, the ability to build all of those services in small pipelines made it a lot easier to put, uh, put those kinds of automated controls in place. All right, now it's a kind of short story, unfortunately. So, you know, around 2018, we were re rebuilding our, our chat approach with Stride. And under under the hood, what, what, what's that? Yeah, yeah, so I was thinking about putting a, uh, instead of that, you know, that uh, a little bit of a rip slide on there, but um, but but it still demonstrates something. We, you know, we've come into a time when we, we really wanted to have, rather than the products themselves be platforms, we needed a platform that was um, providing us things that we could build products out of. And so uh, Micros is our kind of PaaS, if you will, uh, our platform as a service. It's uh, when, when we were shipping Stride, it was entirely microservice composed. So there were uh, you know, different parts of the application that you could do if you wanted to mention somebody. There was a microservice calling that up if you wanted to send an action or um, you like capture decisions. There were different microservices for those pieces. And what's really significant here is that uh, around the, the fall of, of 2017, um, when Stride was, was really ramp, ramping up, our, our, um, our product management and design folks started to re think differently about how they wanted to talk about products. And they, they came up with this idea of the Atlassian teamwork platform. So they were kind of where, where technically we were building out Micros as a platform as a service, they were starting to think in platform terms too. Uh, and so these elements that they described are, are their attempt to think in those elements, to kind of reconsider how products are built and um, uh, designed. So, so they're starting with a very microservice oriented approach. They're, like that's even kind of uh, pervaded their, their, their way of thinking and planning. Okay, so I'll return to this idea of ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's not only important that we compose our products from, from elements as microservices, but it's also critical that we work with, with other vendors' services. So this means uh, integrations, this means, uh, you know, for uh, 
for identity, for things like the, those SAML providers that, that help people bring their, their own uh, user bases in, for media types, so extending beyond just ones that are like Microsoft Office. Um, and we want our software tool chains to work better with, with tools for infrastructure as code or, or for the cloud. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of reason why we want better ecosystem. Now, one of the uh, very recent things that we've had to, to go through and, and you know, ha um, has kind of moved us to better security as, as we worked on this e ecosystem is that we put a lot of effort into satisfy GDPR. Uh, so inside of Atlassian, uh, we refer to those letters as general destruction of public roadmaps. Uh, it's been very disruptive to have this come along. However, while the regulation is mostly focused on privacy, it has helped us to better understand uh, some, some key aspects of security. Uh, for example, we used to have user records, including usernames and passwords, across multiple applications. Bitbucket had its own usernames and passwords, and Jira had its own usernames and passwords. Uh, and that meant that th there's like a really broad attack service, uh, uh, surface on all of these products. If you uh, get into JIRA and, and were to get its data, well then you'd be able to get into Confluence and Bitbucket and maybe even some third party products. Uh, so fortunately GDPR, because uh, in order to satisfy this idea of right to be forgotten, we have to start to collect the user's data into one place so that we could possibly delete it. And, um, and, and that's meant that, that we've narrowed that attack surface. Now there's just Atlassian access that has all of that information in it and then opens up the possibilities to, for customers to be able to do two-factor two authentication uh, or uh, other uh, security measures like um, password standards and uh, timeouts, uh, reset, uh, you know, resetting after a certain timeout. Um, Yeah. So yeah. So I think the the you know for us the important thing of like pulling all of that information into one underlying service was something that let us implement our own security policies in one place. So it made it a lot easier to get more secure faster. So you know I'm looking back. Uh, you know I wasn't even here for the whole journey. Uh, you know, but it has been a, quite a, a long one from our open source ish days, uh, where we realized we needed extensibility to where we were offering more like replaceability, the ability to plug other things in through a service provider model, to the things that we did in the OSGI days to make our builds more independent, uh, to, to make sure that we could um, separate teams out and have, have separate teams building different pieces of the application, to our first features like Bitbucket pipelines written as a pure microservice, and then, then into the days that we are now, where we have an underlying platform called Micros that we can build on top of. Um, so without all of the, the you know, the, the technology around that, the most important thing is that it's really, all of those steps have allowed us to build a, 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 a thriving and, and viable ecosystem uh, with which, without which we wouldn't have been successful. So, uh, for that matter, our um, microservice story isn't some kind of happily ever after. We're not, uh, we're certainly not done with that. It's just an ongoing journey. Uh, okay, so, so I just want to close on, on one key thought. So if you're starting your microservices journey now, uh, go there with a company that's, that's been on that journey for over a decade. Uh, we've, you know, targeted and focused tools that, that reflect that uh, experience. And if you need help combining those uh, uh, solutions into something comprehensive to help solve uh, microservices and, and governance and security problems, then I hope you'll uh, go with a knowledgeable uh, solution partner like XPM. Thanks. So, all right, so welcome back. For this last section, we're going to be doing a panel of experienced um, business people for uh, different walks of life. And so we have a couple of uh, questions uh, that will maybe generate some conversation and thoughts. So we're not really sure where, uh, where the topic's going to take us. So we're just going to jump right in and get started. Um, as kind of a uh, warm-up question, we talked a lot about um, getting people excited about governance. 
and uh, you know, getting them excited specifically almost at the, at the ground level so that we can develop governments from the ground up. So here's a question to, to kind of kick off the conversation. Do you ever have, an, have you ever had an experience where you were able to get people excited about volunteering or getting involved? And what were some of the things you did to make that successful? Sure, if you got that or anything. If you join the committee, you might actually see the change that you've been asking for for the last six months. <laughs> I, I can actually talk on this for a little bit, but I won't. Um, I'm on a local school board, and I have been for the last uh, 12 years. I'm getting ready to enter my fifth term. So there's a lot to getting people actually involved. And uh, one of the main things we've been able to do to get level of involvement um, increase dramatically and I think it actually does carry over into this is that you, by showing people the impact and the value that it can have and not just on them but on their co-workers or in the case of the school district on their families and on their friends and their friends families if you can begin to show the value and the the ability to free somebody up um, to actually do productive work and add value instead of sitting in meetings like we discussed earlier today or fighting through other people's uh, problems that uh, problems that were created by others there's a lot of it is a long process if you were thinking about in terms of sales it is a long sale to show somebody what you know to get somebody convinced that this is going to be of value to them but once you do and if you can do that then they get invested pretty heavily in our company, uh, as we introduced uh, Java and Conf Confluence, uh, given our company's history, we've been notorious with bringing products in, just standing them up and saying, OK, start using them, folks. Um, so we tried a different approach with, uh, with Java. And we had a forum called uh, uh, Java and Jira. Java and Jira. And uh, so we had coffee, breakfast provided for folks. Whomever wanted to come could come, and people turned out in droves, believe it or not. And they got excited about not only that we had this product coming and they were understanding what the product was about, but the fact that we showed them the road of how we had made an investment in finding out how the various teams were doing business and how we were trying to base the, the customization of JIRA up on, uh, on this platform, on, on this standard of basically their input. So we showed them that we were looking for their input and how good this was going to be for them. At the end of this, we had multiple folks coming up volunteering, saying, what can I do to help? And much of it was governance-wise. It was, what can I help to set the standard and so on and so forth. So it was that excitement, but also showing them, uh, you know, we're, we're investing in you and letting you actually participate. So that was our experience. Um. So, so right now I'm running a, a customer engagement survey. And the customer engagement survey is the people that use the tools that I provide. And as part of that is a roadmap. And the roadmap says, you know, we're really good at administering the tools, but we don't know all the cases that you possibly use it for. And so as part of that is uh, allowing people to provide the feedback that says, what, what do you need? And so I had one of, one of our senior leaders yesterday stick his hand up and said, do you have a committee that I can join? because I want to be part of that roadmap. Mm -hmm. And so being open to the fact that you might not have all the answers and you need the input from people in the business who know that better than I do is probably one way that you'll get people to volunteer. If you, if you say that we're not going to make any changes and this is how it's going to be, then, then why would you self, why would you sign up to be on the committee if you know that there's going to be no changes enacted? So um, that's the way that, that, that I do it. So, so although I'm at Atlassian now, where Confluence is taken as just uh, de facto norm, I've been in two prior companies where I was the Confluence champion. And the, the most powerful thing that I found to drive engagement, at least with that, was just modeling what you can do. And, and the ability in Confluence to just copy and paste and then, you know, like modify from, from there makes that an incredibly empowering way to just let people get involved. So, I don't know, that's, that's what's worked for me. Good. Anyone else? Comments? Yeah, I want to introduce one of my uh, experience uh, when I work for a company 
we have a, a huge instance of Jira, and uh, instead of uh, putting this uh, top down, uh, top down uh, to enforce this governance, we set up some internal AOG. It's kind of a way to means uh, to use this uh, grassroots uh, methodology to attract people to participate in the discussion and uh, to show their concern. It's a very relaxed uh, atmosphere. It's a uh, uh, bring your own lunch event, and when people have an idea, we can just uh, to select some uh, means uh, people as a volunteer to focus on different area. We have a monthly meetup. It's an internal company meetup. We just uh, under the AOG's name, but it's a, it's a really good methodology to to spread this, uh, uh, how can I say, the Atlassian culture inside of the company. Great. All right, guys. So since you all answered that question so well, I'm going to take you to a harder question. So we just had Ian give us a great presentation on some of the history of, uh, of Atlassian and Atlassian products. So let's combine that presentation with the conversation we've had all day talking about governance. So considering both of those, is there something that you would like to see Atlassian do in the future that maybe could support governance or maybe even improvements or changes to current systems or maybe even a product in the future that would be a great product for governance? <laughs> no, there's just a lot of like admin related things on the, on the back end that make it hard to, I mean, obviously a lot of add-ons have gone through the process of making this work, but there's just simple things um, to make it easier to go through all of the configuration pages, to find things that are unused, to find things that could be cleaned up, sort of a self-cleaning feature. Um, I believe some of that's coming out on Data Center, though, um, which is great when you're on Data Center. <laughs> so, yeah, um, more stuff like that to help to help the administrators just do their jobs, I think, would be great. I mean, obviously, it's really great already. I do my living out of this, but, um, yeah, that would be nice. I don't mean to point at you, no, Ian. No, I'm no, not no, sure no, why no, I'm no, talking no, straight no, at you. I'm waiting for <laughs> Ian's answer. I, I, <laughs> I'm excited to hear what Ian's going to say. <laughs> From the feature-wise, uh, uh, because Atlassian Tools is starting from uh, a very agile, small, when we talk about scale-up, uh, instead of a go to the data center, I want to see, uh, instead of a centralized, I want to see how they can do the federation, means uh, the feature can, can do the governance across multiple Jira instance. So that will mm. give us a lot of flexibility, and also the money-wise, the plugin scenario, we, we can benefit from that. So maybe mine is less of a wish and, and maybe more of uh, what are we doing or thinking in this space. Uh, at, at least on the cloud side, one of the things you'll see is that the, the next gen projects are much more self-contained, which enables a lot more delegation of governance. So you can push down a lot more decisions about workflows and custom fields with a lot less of the overhead that those things bring to one one big instance. Uh, I, I love the idea of federation. I think that's a that's an important direction to to go in. Uh, and you know, like from from my perspective, dealing with some of Atlassian's biggest customers, one that's almost unavoidable. So um, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Any other wishes? Any other thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> Now's the time to get them out. <laughs> so, so going back to uh, something that I saw develop back in the networking world as it was emerging, and yes, I'm dating myself, but uh, in those days, the network management platforms kind of, uh, we had some of the same problems. You had no way, you had no way to, to manage the, uh, your, your network across a, at, a, at any kind of scale, and things like uh, what became VLANs and VLAN tagging and all that kind of stuff. That was a, that, that was a, those were things that you couldn't even do until some certain foundations were put in place, um, and I think we're seeing some of that in what we're being what we're talking about in organizations that have 50, 60 instances. There needs to be a way to bring some consistency across those, but as partners, we can't. We have to do some major hacking and some major work inside the databases and some major data munging just to make that even possible. So, um, you know, somehow 
and I think some of that effort is starting to happen, but bringing some order to that chaos, you know, it's not a problem that, that is new. It's one that's been solved before in other industries. And it's just really good to, to see Atlassian as an organization be able to pick that up and, and really take it to the next level. Any rebuttal from the Atlassian <laughs> guy? Okay. Speaking for the entire company. Yeah. <laughs> right. We have no trouble putting you on the spot, Ian. None at That's all. That's right. All right. So um, thoughts and ideas that we talked about in governance today are actually broader thoughts and ideas than maybe just Atlassian. Um, how could companies replicate the ideas and structures and successes of Atlassian governance into other non-Atlassian activities, maybe even processes like Agile or other products like Microsoft, Google, et cetera? Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> now, um, actually, it's, it's really cool because with a lot of our clients, they wind up looking at these, at these models and go, oh, that's great. We're going to use that for all of our IT right now. And they wind up creating either the same committee or the other, I, this happens over and over again, where they, where they wind up taking this model and just running it through their entire company, um, at least for product uh, control. So um, I, it, it maps very easily, I think, to that. Well, and you guys lived through an experience where a customer not only took it, took the governance model out beyond into other IT realms, they've kind of begun to take it across the entire governance of a, of a, a regulated organization. Mm -hmm. So all governance practices through, through the system yeah. and, and Jira and Confluence absolutely work for that. So another wish might be, hey, let's, what about some tooling that would make it really obvious that, that this, this combination can work almost at a very high level in, in some of these areas? Jira committee. Maybe Something. some, some <laughs> almost, almost back to the previous question, some platinums, or platinum, some platforms or reports that could actually be like governance based reports. Anybody else have thoughts on that one before we move on to the next one? Yeah. Well, I'll take a quick. Uh, no, I, you know, if, and I think if, if, if I kind of think along those lines of, uh, using Jira and Confluence, or reusing instances of Confluence and Jira in this way, then it means having some kind of uh, portability of the of the configurations. And I think you know there are some marketplace apps uh, like Botron that help people kind of pluck out Jira configuration and put it down somewhere else. Um, with with Confluence, you have templates, and I think those become some of the mechanisms by which you can transfer. Those uh, those practices across organizational boundaries and kind of pass them around. So um, yeah, maybe maybe that's what you guys should build and put in the marketplace is some of those things. <laughs> Way to sling it back. Oh no, yeah. Yeah, maybe nice, nicely done. Do okay, so one more question here from me. Uh, so um, I'll say this is kind of the fun question. Do you does anybody have any horror stories? or um, of control or governance of, um, of a process that maybe went really wrong, where maybe uh, something uh, like governance could have helped, uh, maybe something like the Atlassian tools or something else. Um, so when you, when you experienced that, were you, what were you able to do to, um, to work through that crisis? And, uh, and, and was there an improvement in a process on the back end of it? Um, and was that able to maybe produce some future success? So um, I can recall coming across a Jira instance with 180,000 users, uh, had 180 projects, it was all 18s, and uh, 180 admins. And <laughs> I remember seeing this and thinking, wow, that's, that's going to be a big job. And um, essentially the only reason it was there was that the quality process was broken because across all of those products, there was no single status that shown whether it'd been through QA. And so QA had, had asked help. And when I looked at it, my only advice was burn it to the ground. So yeah. <laughs> the, amount, the amount of labor that's gonna be involved to do this, <laughs> to get it to where you want it to be, is, is, is not a small amount. We are, you know, it's pretty much cut your losses and just move it. And um, I remember saying that and someone said, you can't say that. I was like, well, it's the honest truth. Like, yeah, at some point you have to just 
like talk straight and that's how it's going to be. And they, end up, they did do that. They did start again. But it was knowing that it was too far gone. Um, the governance came in too late. And so if you, 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 your company needs to continue to, to deliver product and the amount of time it's going to take to get there, we're not going to see the benefits. So you know, stand up that new instance, migrate the teams, whether you use whether you configuration, who knows. But um, sometimes you do have to just cut the losses and move on. And you know, I'm... I've got one at the moment where we're considering the federated approach. Um, federated approach doesn't save us any money. It, we get it by on the license. But you've got to think, okay, the, num- the thousands of people have got to move. And things to do, this is going to cause a lot of disruption while I do this. And so the federation might be the best, worst option, right? It's, it's, it's going to be terrible. And we might need to build a platform that allows us to search across instances. Mm-hmm. But given the size, that's what we're going to do. But, you know, this is a problem that Atlassian hasn't solved, right? Federation has been took up for a while. Um, yeah, again, best, worst option. Yeah, are, there, are there burn stories? Yeah, there's... Um, we had to help a customer uh, in New York uh, navigate... So a pretty difficult situation. They had a, a very large instance and had set up a number of scripts that would automatically create issues. And um, they had an offshore team that triggered the script on a looped basis for a whole weekend. And so they came back and they had a, a, an incredible level of corruption. Um, but what we were able to work through there was yes, we had to create an app to because you don't want to go through even um, bulk edit at that point in time would only get you a thousand at a time, and when you're dealing with millions of issues, <laughs> you need to get deleted. It's a much bigger problem. So you know we solved that programmatically. I mean that wasn't even that hard. Um, but the the main thing was to actually get some ideas in place that yes, automation makes sense. And and the governance aspect of it was, here's where automation makes sense. Here's where it doesn't. Here's how you put some, some safeguards around it and how you make it something that, that won't cause you to have to burn your instance to the ground. Because if you can think, if you think about some of the issues that could have been created there and if it hadn't been caught, then there would have been, you know, there was another. There was another situation. Actually, it was another company in New York, that um, where they had had a script kind of burning through, creating issues, and um, they didn't know it. And so they had they had some projects that had blown up, and they actually had to end up burning it to the ground and starting over, just because everything was so corrupted and intermingled with legitimate data and fake. You know, how do you how do you sort it out? So anyway. Got a not a horror story, but a success story where like just working with teams who were all working in their own silos, um, like you know each person had their own project, each uh, each person was tracking their own work, and nobody was looking at it centralized. And so there were, they, obviously that comes with its own huge problems. And so by working with individual team members one on one, just kind of the method I talked about before, uh, we actually wound up getting everybody into the same project, and like that team wound up just humming along incredibly smoothly. And the best part was there was a control case right along next to them that didn't do that. And they <laughs> had then continued to just slam into each other over and over again. So it was a really, really nice to see the JIRA tools work along with the softer skills to make everybody come together um, around their work. <laughs> yeah, a lot of horror stories. All right. Um, all right, so I, I've worked with, with uh, Confluence since uh, version 2.5.3. And Way back then, I made one design decision that that is been really expensive ever since. And yeah, we, you mentioned about the different governance boards before, but the one that was missing is an information architecture steering board to make sure that the right infrastructure decisions you're making are long-term good decisions. Mm-hmm. And the company I worked at that time, we only had two database services: it was Oracle or SQL Server. Uh, I was just better friends with the Oracle guy than the, the, the Microsoft guy. No other reason than that. And so when I installed that version of Confluence, I got him to create an Oracle database instead of a SQL Server database. Seemed okay at the time. Um, 
But that confluence is 2006, and it's grown so big now that it can't be moved, and so it's the only enterprise service that's on Oracle, all right? And everything else is on SQL Server. They mm -hmm. can't move it. And so the licensing impact, single cost of that decision, because I didn't have a review of my decisions at the time, and uh, Stash, Bitbucket, all the others are all running on the SQL Server, except Confluence. Mm -hmm. And so anything that needs to be custom written has to be done on the Oracle side. And when I, when I left that company a few years ago, we still joke about this one decision. And I was like, yep, that was a bad one to make. But it's the importance of having someone else peer review the decisions. Didn't seem like a big decision at the time. You know, if, got it, if I got it early enough, I probably could have done a, an export and then reloaded and we'd be happy. But it is just too big now. Other, other eyes on. Yeah. Other eyes on. And it was purely just, you know, over instant messaging server, I just messaged, can you create me the, the schema over in Oracle? Done. And off we went. And maybe it's cost a million dollars since then. Maybe seven million. Who knows? Like the licensing cost alone is just far outweighs the, the, the peer review it could have just had. And they said, why don't you just go get it on SQL Server? Because that's where we're doing all, the, all of our other enterprise apps. Yeah. Great story. Anybody else? All right. So those are the those are the initial questions I had. So what kind of questions or comments do you guys have for each other? I have a question that I was going to hear the answer to. Um, I know I have I I helped put on this event and I learned some things today. Um, what would you what are you take what are your takeaways and what are you going to do differently because of the stuff we talked about today? That's the, hard, that's the hard question of the day. Be practical. I mean, I will. I mean, I'll start since everybody's thinking real hard. There, all of a sudden, has put you on the spot. Um, but you know, I'm thinking about something that Ian had said to me when we were talking on the side, and that is, you know, the the issue of governance is very important, no matter whether you're dealing with Atlassian or like I mentioned earlier, you're dealing with a school district. I mean, governance is an issue or you're dealing with the U.S. Congress. This is a whole other issue. But you, when you're dealing with governance, you're, you're, you've got things that are in common across many different areas of our lives because it involves people. They need to be governed. But then there's also the types of issues that come about at different levels of scale. Just like a, a family with two kids has many different issues than a family with seven. You know, a family with seven kids, their their level of, of structure has to be much more defined in order to even function. So it's just like that here. We have we have we have customers that have they might be a high tech organization and they may have uh, a bunch of different systems, but there's only fifty people. And then they're on the other end of the spectrum we have uh, we get a call and a request to spin up a 10,000 user instance because we need to add we need to add a new group um, to to the to the system so that's on top of, I think 51 or something um, so when you start talking about that sort th that sort of scale the issues of governance while the processes and the principles are the same the implications and the application are a little different so that's something that I've been thinking about ever since you said that earlier, so I'm glad you were here even for that, just for that reason. Um, but I'm looking forward to digging into that more clearly because we intuitively will go in and do that with somebody. We don't try to apply the same principles to somebody that has 100 people as somebody that has 10,000 people. But it, defining that is actually kind of an important concept. One of my uh, practical takeaway from my side is, uh, I think we need to set up, to set up this uh, governance uh, framework, like it's a triangle. I think that's very important for us to identify all the stakeholder within your organization, mm -hmm. who will be, uh, who will be the decision maker, and uh, who will be like, let's say the program manager or project manager will involve in the add-on review. Because uh, most of time is uh, because to deploy uh, Atlassian product is a very uh, vertical uh, process from this uh, uh, server hard the, the bare metal install the OS. When you expose your uh, uh, your server on internet, you need to talk up to the network guy, the security, and the to 
if any workflow change is a project manager, I think the first thing is to identify the different stakeholder and uh, to write their, write their name down and also their contact on your portal. Let everybody know who should be your first point of contact to to talk when they have a problem. And also like this uh, how-to article will help uh, a lot of uh, the admin to solve their, to easy their life because most of companies is a single admin to manage the really vertical from workflow change, project level, server, they really manage a lot. But uh, I think there are two parts can easy their life. First to documentation, uh, to the documentation about uh, the how to article means the training part. Another is uh, the automation to try to use some uh, plugin or different uh, uh, scripting to automate the process to means uh, that admin can focus on more important tasks. I believe my takeaway from today is that, you know, there was some really good advice on, on governance type structures today. And uh, in our organization, we're actually switching over from uh, three different kinds of products into JIRA and Confluence. And so the, the conversation has been, um, okay, as we get more and more teams on the products, um, and then they have suggestions. What are we going to do with those suggestions? Are we just going to throw them at the administrator and then we just make changes randomly or what type of structure? And so it's been widely agreed that we would have some type of structure, some type of framework in place for this type of governments. But uh, this actually gave advice today. So we can actually take some of this today and, and utilize it. So it's, it's been really productive. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I, have, I have probably one piece of that governance model already in place. I've got 16 members on a committee that we've run this through. Um, I ran uh, an upgrade in October and there are varying degrees of um, varying degrees of comments from that committee and probably what I'm taking away today is that that 16 member committee could probably actually be brought, broken down into groups who have a real high engagement and those who just want to be informed. Mm. And inside that group there are people who, you know, who are, who are there because they started with the conversation of, I was the Jira admin at my previous company, and so they, they want to be involved. But they probably don't really want to be involved in the higher level strategic things that are going on. They want to know about the upgrade. They want to know about what test cases did you run, what scaling are you going to do. But yeah, probably breaking it down would probably end up with, the, with a better level of engagement. And there's 16 people, so I'm sure I can probably divide that at least three ways. I saw something reflected here today that I, I, I it's like it, it sounds different when somebody else says it, and it was that separation between application layer and and system layer, and the the question that I asked earlier was about the you know like and how is that different for cloud? What well, well, but in my head were, were were so many customers who are of the I think mistaken belief that if they could just get to our SaaS, they don't have to worry about the system side, and so you know like the, there's you know. Uh, you know, I think the practical thing for me is actually to remind them, no, you want these products connected to other things, that's going to be a system concern. It doesn't go away. You may, mm -hmm. you know, I think you said, you know, it, it gets, gets less. less. There's not hardware right. to manage. Uh, but it doesn't go away. And I think that's, a, you know, that's a, an important reminder for anybody running or, you know, trying to make the leap into cloud that, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. Oh yeah, no. I'm um, going off of going off of what uh, Greg said. Um, like something, I, I, you can make a small decision that winds up costing you know eventually millions of dollars. Um, even even a, a small decision such as naming something wrong in the beginning and then and then having to go re-explain it to people over and over again as they call you up and ask you for help. So just like when you go to make these configuration changes, having having another set of eyes. Yeah, I'll, I'll add my two cents too. The one thing I learned every time I talk to somebody about governance is that it's much easier to talk about governance than it is to do governance. And so I learned a little bit more about that today too. Even if you even if you could have a magic genie that could completely structure all of your information and documents and everything around governance, you would then have to come back and figure out how you can actually make that uh, available to people where they could actually find it and use it and things like that. So actually the implementation is always harder than talking about it for sure. Very good. So um, anybody else have any other comments or questions uh, before we kind of wrap up this last session for the day? One thing that, uh, you know, Steve was mentioning kind of triggered a, a thought. Um, he mentioned, you know, 
talking about governance up front is much easier and getting on top of it in the in the beginning is much easier than than later on and I think that's been very apparent today another thing I've noticed and I'm in quite a few agile communities user communities uh, outside of talking about tools is uh, I, I think there is something prevalent out there as well as we want to remind folks there's a difference in following good agile practices and then using these tools versus uh, it's the it's it's how much governance we have around it. Uh, I think sometimes uh, teams, uh, even management, has this misnomer that uh, oh it's the tool. Oh, we need to put more governance around the tool. Uh, it's all the tool's fault. But sometimes, if you really kind of take a good look at it, it is just that it's a company's um, investment in in their teams, in their agile practices with their teams, and actually in their backlog. So the backlog that's going into the tool and the best practices around that, such as very, very good uh, backlog refinement practices, um, modeling stories up front, and then introducing them to the collaborative teams so that you don't have um, duplicate stories or bad stories sitting in the tool. So this is just one little reminder that this kind of, you know, Steve had triggered to me is there is definitely a difference in practicing, you know, good agile and then using the tool. And these are the very powerful tools we're talking about today. So they're great tools. Uh, and then the governance, and you shouldn't get confused between the two. Uh, and I do see management and companies and teams doing that from time to time. So just, uh, just something to comment. Yeah put out there okay well thanks to all of our panelists today for joining us and participating here I think we had some good comments and, and, and good conversation and thank you for everybody online for participating as well and we will hope to see you uh, sometime soon out in the world of Atlassian <laughs>